All right, welcome to the video. My name is John Elder from codemy.com. And in this video, we're gonna to start to talk about graphical user interfaces with Python, specifically using Kinter or tkinter, as it's, I guess, called. And that's a module that comes built in with Python that allows you to create GUIs, graphical user interfaces, relatively easy and very, very quickly. So we're gonna to start to look into that in this video, show you the very, very basics. This is gonna be a series of videos so you can follow along and, uh, and learn all about it. So before we get started, if you like this video and wanna see more, be sure to smash the like button below, subscribe to the channel, and be sure to check out codemy.com where I have dozens of courses with hundreds of videos that teach you to code. Use coupon code YouTube to get $22 off membership. That's all my courses, videos, and books for a one-time fee of just $27, which is pretty insane. Uh, <laughs> but check that out if you're interested. So let's get right into it. Like I said, Python comes built in with tkinter, or kinter as some people call it. I'm probably gonna call it kinter. I kind of dropped the T, it's silent. If I call it tkinter, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna assume you already have Python installed on your machine. Now this should work on Windows, Linux, or Mac. I'm on a Windows computer, so just sort of keep that in mind. But I'm gonna assume you already have Python installed. If you don't, you can go find another video to install it. I'm gonna assume you already sort of know how to use Python, so you can run a, a script and make it work without me having to show you how to do that. So let's just jump right in here. Here I have the Sublime Text Editor. You can use absolutely any text editor that you want. I like Sublime, it's free, it's pretty cool. So I've just got an unsaved file open right now. So to start, we need to import Kinter. And it's really easy, we just go from lowercase t, k-i-n-t-e-r, t Kinter, and then we want to import everything, right? So right away, let's go ahead and save this file. Well, let's first view, I wanna say syntax, we want this to be Python. Okay, so it pops up. Let's go ahead and save this. And I'm gonna to navigate to my C directory. You can save this anywhere you want, wherever you just, you'll remember it. I created this GUI, Geographical User Interface Directory, and this is where I'm gonna save all this stuff. So let's just call this one hello, and go ahead and save it. Okay, so it says hello.py, this is a Py file, Python file. Okay, so pretty straightforward. We're just gonna import this module, tkinter, import everything. Now this allows us to use everything in tkinter. There's some other ways you can in import this, but this is sort of the, the main way that you do it. And I'm not gonna talk about any other ways because this is what you're gonna want to use 99.9% .9 of the time. So in kinter, everything is a widget. There's button widgets, text widgets, frame widgets. Everything's a widget. And the first thing you create is sort of the root widget. It's think of it like the window, any graphical user interface program on your computer has like a window. If you're on a Windows machine, it's the Windows window. If you're on a Mac or Linux, it's the same kind of, you know, boxy window thing. So we need to create that before we do anything else. So we call it the root, it's the root widget. And we just set this equal to a T, K, and that's it. So. This has to go first. This has to happen before anything else in your program when you're working with tkinter. So just right off the bat, just make it the first thing that you always do. So for the rest of this video, we're gonna create just a very, very simple window, sort of a hello world window and, uh, and run it. So we want it to like say some text, right? And the text will just be whatever we want, hello world or whatever. So we need to create a label widget. Now throughout the course of this series, I'm gonna talk about all the different widgets. We're gonna talk about them all in great detail uh, and we'll get into that in the future. For this video, we're just gonna use the label widget. I'm not gonna talk about it in great depth because it's very simple. I might talk about it in more detail a little bit later on, but to create anything is, in Kinter is really a two-step process. You have to define the thing and create it, and then you have to put it up on the screen. So it's two steps always. So the first step, we're just gonna create a label widget. So I'm just gonna call this my label, labor, and then set this equal to, it's a label widget. So we have this label function, right? And then we want this to go in our root widget, right? And then for the text, we want it to go hello world, if I could type correctly, right? And that's it. So we've now created a label a label widget. Now we have to put that widget into our root widget, into our root window, right? So that's the two-step process that I was talking about. Now there's a couple of different ways that you can put things on the screen with tkinter. 
And the first one we're going to look at is pack. We're just going to pack it in there. And when you think of pack, think of just like packing. You're just shoving it in there at the first available spot, right? It's just sort of, it'll be the size that it is. It's very unsophisticated. We're just shoving it in there. And that's why I'm going to use it for this video because we haven't learned anything else. Primarily, you're going to use the other method to put stuff on the screen. And we'll talk about that later, um, probably in the next couple of videos. But for right now, we're just going to pack this thing in there. So what we do is we take our widget, which is my label, and then dot pack. And that's it. So here we're creating a, let's just call it a text. Well, it's a label. We'll call it a label widget. And then here we are shoving it onto the screen, right? So that's it. So now the last thing we need to do is create an event loop. And what an event loop is, when you have a graphical user interface, when you have a program running, it's always looping constantly. And that's how it figures out what's going on. So as it's looping, you might move your mouse cursor, right? Since it's looping, it notices, oh, the mouse is here. Now it's here. Now it's here. Now it's here. Because it's continually looping. If you go to click a button, you know, it, it loops, it sees you moving towards that button as it's looping, looping, looping. So it's a constant loop. So you have to create that loop. And normally when a program ends is when that loop ends. You know, if you're familiar with programming of any kind, you're familiar with loops. They keep going until something happens, right? And in this case, they keep going until the program ends and then they end. So to do that, we want to create a root. This is our root widget. And then we want to call it main loop because this is the main loop of the program, right? And that's it. So let's go ahead and save this. Now, this is ridiculously simple. We've just created a graphical user interface, an actual program that will run and be visually, you know, cool. Well, it's not that cool. We'll see in a second here, but it works. And it's like, what is this? One, two, three, four, five lines of code. That's ridiculous. That's very, very simple. Now, granted, this is a very unsophisticated, easy program, but I think you can see right away how simple it is to use this. Tcanter is no more complicated than this, right? If you have a bigger program that you want to create, sure, there's going to be more lines of code, but everything is a widget, and this is how easy it is to create a widget. You just define it and then pack it in there somehow. That's it. So it's not that hard to use this tkinter, which is really cool. So let's go ahead and run this and see what we got. I'm pulling up. I have this git bash terminal. Uh, I downloaded this. You can just Google git bash if you want to use this one. You absolutely don't. You can use any terminal that's on your computer or any way that you already used in the past to run Python programs. Windows has a command prompt. It has the PowerShell installed. You can use either of those. If you're on a Mac or Linux, you could use your regular terminal, whatever. So I'm going to change directory into C. GUI. And just to make sure our hello file is there, it sure is. So let's just run this file. So I type in Python and then hello.py. And uh oh, something happened. Object has no attribute main loop. What did we do? Oh, <laughs> uh, the L must be lowercase. Joey. All right, so go ahead and save this. Pull this back up again, run it again. And here we have, it's on my other monitor. So let me drag it over and there we have it. Let's put it up here. So this is it. So let's pull our code back up as well. Okay, so here it says, hello world, because we typed right here, hello world. And this is the little tkinter icon, it's a favicon. We can change that and we'll talk about that later. You can see this program has a minimize button that works. It has a maximize button that works and an X button that works. So when we click that, it ended automatically. So we can run this again just for fun. And let's pull this over. Now we can resize this and it kind of resizes things automatically. In the future video, I'm going to show you how to explicitly resize it. So when you started it, it doesn't start small like this. But in this case, we use pack and pack says, you know, pack this in just as as big as the stuff inside is. And our text widget is only 
you know, what is this, 10, 12 characters, so it's only that big, the whole widget. It's only that big, so the window is only that big. Uh, pretty cool. So that's it. That's how easy it is. And check it out. I mean, this is a full-on Windows window, right? Has all the things you would expect. You know, minimize, maximize, a little X. Very cool. And see this X right here, what you're doing when you're closing this window is you're disrupting this main loop, this root loop and that causes the program to end. So we'll look at all this in more detail in the next few videos. All right, in the last video, we did our Hello World program, and we positioned the stuff on the screen using Pack, which is a very, very simple and easy way to position things, but doesn't give you a whole lot of control. In this video, I wanna talk about the grid system. It's a better way to position things on the screen, and it's the, the way you're gonna use most of the time. So let's take a look at our code from last time. And remember, we use this pack. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just going to save as, let's save this as a different file. I'm gonna call this grid.py. And let's pull up our terminal real quick and just run this program, grid.py. And remember, I'm in C forward slash GUI, the directory I created for all of our files here. And we can pull this over and you can see here it is, just a very basic program, hello world. Now, the thing to remember about this is Look what happens when we resize this. It stays in the middle. And we can play around with this all we want. And this stays right where it is. That's one of the nice things about Pack. It, it keeps it exactly where it's supposed to be. But it doesn't give you a whole lot of control. So going further in this video, we're going to go ahead and look at the grid system. Now, the grid system is exactly like it sounds. It's a grid. So think of all of your programs as a grid. Grids have columns up and down and they have rows left to right. And just visualize that in your head and you pretty much understand the grid system. Now, we, we deal with the grid system using numbers. So you would say row zero to put it in the very top row, row one to put it in the next row, row two, row three, row four. Same thing with columns, column zero. It all starts with zero. Computers always start with zero, right? So column zero, column one, column two, column three. That's really all there is to it. Now. There's a couple of little tricky things you have to know, and we're gonna talk about those in this video, but really it's not too bad. So let's come over here and let's modify this code. So we have my label. I'm just gonna copy and paste these, and let's call this one my label one, and this one my label two. And we'll keep this one the same. And then for this one, let's just change it to my name is John Elder, right? So instead of packing these things in, we wanna use the grid system. and it's really very simple. We just type in my label, my label one, and then dot grid, right? So instead of dot pack, it's dot grid. And same thing here. Let's go my label two dot grid. Now, inside of this parentheses, inside of this function, we need to just tell the program where we want these things. So let's go row equals zero and column equals zero. So I'm just gonna copy these down to here. And let's change this to row one and column zero. So they're gonna be in the same column, one will be on top and one will be on bottom, right? Pretty simple. So go ahead and save this and let's run this and see if it's, it does what we expect. Pull this over, oops, hard to get it. Grab on it, there we go. So here we go, hello world, and directly below it is my name is John Elder. Now you'll notice that the program itself is still just as big as the text, so it hasn't expanded any. We'll talk about that later. But here's the thing to see, check this out. If we resize this, this stuff doesn't automatically resize. It stays right where it is. Row one, column, row zero, column zero, row one, column zero. So that's one sort of thing to keep in mind. So let's go ahead and close this. Now let's play around with this a little bit. Pull our code back up. So let's say we want, well, let's just change this to column one, see what this looks like. So if we save this, I'm back here, and I'm just pressing up on my keyboard. It pastes in the last command. Okay, so now if we pull this over, we can see, and let's pull up our code too. There we go. So row zero and row one, so this is row zero, left to right, 
This is row one. Remember the rows and the columns all start at zero. And column zero, so right here, up and down. And this is column one, right here, up and down. So pretty straightforward. And one thing you have to realize about this that kind of stinks is that this is all relative. They're relative to each other. And what I mean by that is, look at this. If we change this from column one, my name is John Elder, let's change it to column five. Now, if we save this and let's, see, let's pull this back up. First, we need to close this. Now, rerun it again. Pull it over and oh, look at that. It's the same as the last time. Even though we put column five, oops, come back, come back. It's still just it looks like it's in column one, the second column over. Why? We're telling it column five. Well, because it's relative. There is nothing in column one, two, three, or four. So Kinter just ignores it, right? So if you wanted something there, you would have to go something like, uh, let's go, let's just copy this and call it my label three. And we might just put like nothing, right? And then we could come down here and let's just copy and paste my label three. And we could go, you know, two, one, doesn't matter. If we save this and let's close this. And now it's not gonna be a whole lot better. You can't you can't really tell because it's just nothing there. So there's there is another column in between these two. It's kind of hard to tell, but there's nothing in it. If we went, you know, something like this and saved this and ran it. Boom. Now you can really see the difference, right? So that's sort of a hacky way to do it. And there's lots of other ways to do this. And as we go forward throughout this series of courses or the series of videos, I'm going to show you all kinds of tips and tricks on how to position things around using the grid system. In this video, I just wanted to short sort of, if I could talk, sort of show you that the grid system exists, give you the very basic fundamentals of it so you can start playing around with it. Now, one last thing I want to talk about before we end this video, let's just close this. And let's get rid of this, and get rid of this. Now, Python is object oriented, and you can do object -y type things with Python. And even though this is Kinter, it's still just Python, right? So we don't have to write our code like this. I always do because it's easier to sort of keep track of things. Remember in the last video, I said, doing everything in Kinter is a two step process. First, you create the thing, then you put the thing on the screen. So here, we're creating the things. And here, we're putting them onto the screen, right? Sure. That's really what you're going to want to do. But you don't have to since Python is object oriented. This dot grid is basically just an object -y sort of thing you can do. So instead of this, you can just slap this on the end. Same thing here. Right? If you're familiar with Ruby programming, we do a lot of stuff like this in Ruby, but you can do it in Python too, because it's object oriented. So you can just slap this on the end, put, put a dot grid. Now, if we save this, come back to our terminal and run this again, we get the exact same thing as we would expect. It's just, we don't have to do it in two steps. We can do it in one step. That's great, right? But you know, this is a very, very basic widget we're creating right here. And it's already pretty big, right? You really want to make it even bigger, even harder to read by doing stuff at the end? Eh, probably not. Maybe sometimes you do. I like cleaner code. And to me, doing it in two steps like this just seems cleaner. It's really a personal preference, but I would sort of recommend you doing it this way in the future. I just wanted to show you that that's possible just to kind of blow your minds a little bit and, and uh, give you a little something to think about. It doesn't really matter what kind of program you're building, what kind of graphical user interface, chances are you're going to need a button for something, probably lots of buttons. So that's what we're going to look at in this video. So in the last video, we looked at the grid system, how to position things around. So I'm going to come up here to our grid.py file. I'm just going to rename this and let's just call this buttons.py. 
Okay, so let's play around with this a little bit. Uh, let's just get rid of all of this. Yeah, let's get rid of this too. Okay, so to create a button in Kinter is pretty simple. A button like everything in Kinter is a widget. So we want to create a button widget. So let's just call this one my button, I guess. And we just call a button and this function, right? Now inside of here, we need to tell it, you know, where we want this. So we want it in root. And then what text, right? So let's say click me, right? So like everything in Kinter, once we define the thing, now we have to actually put it up on the screen. So let's just go my button dot pack, we'll just pack it in there, just for example purposes. So go ahead and save this. And let's head over here to our terminal. And remember, I'm in C forward slash GUI. It's just the directory I created, you can, you know, save these anywhere you want. So let's go Python, and then buttons dot py. And pull this over my other monitor. And we see there it is click me now when we click on this thing, it doesn't do anything because we haven't told it to do anything yet. So before we do that, I want to show you one more kind of cool thing. Right up here when you're defining this thing, you can pull a state. So state equals let's call this disabled. Right? So if we save this come back here and hit reload. And drag this guy over, you can see now the button is disabled, it won't even click, right? It's sort of grayed out a little bit. So that, that's kind of cool. One other thing we can look at before we learn how to actually have these things do something, let's get rid of this, we can sort of change the size of these. So we can pad x. And we can pad y first, let's look at pad x. So let's say 50, right? Sort of an arbitrary thing. Come back here and reload this guy. And let's pull this over. And you can see now the button is wider, right? X, think of like an x, y axis, right? So the x is sort of horizontal and the y is vertical. Y is up and down and x is left and right, right? So that's cool. So we could change this to any size we want, I just put 50. Next, let's go pad y equals 50. Just to see what this looks like, save this and run it. Pull this over. And so you see now we have a big square button. Hard to tell. If I click it, there we go. Right? So that's kind of neat, right? Um, let's see, just for fun, let's get rid of the pad x, see what this looks like, save it, and run it. <laughs> so okay, so it's a tall skinny button, I don't know why you would ever want to do this. To tell you the truth, you're probably never going to want to resize a button anyway, but you may just for, you know, aesthetic reasons, sometimes need to make your button a little bigger or smaller. So that's how you do that. So we can change the size with pad x and pad y, we can disable and enable with the state. Now, we need this to actually do something. How do we get a button to do something in Kinter? Well, let's close this. It's actually very, very easy. What we do is create a function, any old function to do anything you want. So let's say we're creating a function here. So we go define my click. And then it's just a function like any other function in Python. And inside of here, you can have it do absolutely anything you want. So let's create remember our my label. And let's call this label. Oops, there we go. And we want it to be in root. And we want the text to say, oops, if I could type, there we go. Look, I clicked a button. Right? Okay, so we've created a label, now we need to put it on the screen. So let's just go my my label dot pack. And I know grid system is better, but this is just for example, and we just want to throw this up on the screen anyway. So that's good to go. So as you know, with a function, it doesn't get executed until it gets called. And that's not a Kinter thing. That's a, just a Python thing. It's really just an object oriented programming thing. So, you know, the program starts here, it executes this line, it executes this line, it sees this and it doesn't actually execute it, it reads it into memory. So then later on, if you want to run it, you can call it and it'll run, but it doesn't actually do anything. And we can prove that by saving this real quick, and we can run this. And let's pull this guy back over. And so you know, when we click here, nothing actually happens because we're not telling it to execute yet. So to actually tell it to execute is really, really simple. We just go, let's go 
command equals, and then name the function, my click. All right, so if we save this, come back here and run this guy one more time. Zoom. We click this, boom, look, I clicked a button. It appears, actually, if we keep clicking it, it keeps putting it up on the screen. That's a discussion for another time. But uh, yeah, it really doesn't matter what you want the button to do, right? If you're, if you built a form, right, and you've got a submit button to submit the form via email to something, right? Same thing, we're just gonna create a function. And then in the function, you'll write different code to do whatever you wanna do. But uh, yeah, just that simple. So it's this command. And now here's something to sort of keep in mind also. Let's pull this guy back up again real quick and close it. Now, normally when you call a function with Python, you call it with those things. Like right here, we're calling this pack function, right? And we put the parentheses. When we did the grid stuff, we were going my button dot grid and then given that, right? So anytime in, in Python, when you call a function, you call the parentheses like that. It's just normal. But here you don't. If we save this and run it, I don't think this is gonna work. It might. No, it doesn't. Uh, let's pull this over. When the program start, it ran it automatically. And so it already has it up there. And when we click the button, it doesn't execute it again like it did in the last little bit we did. So you're gonna forget and do that because what you're doing here is calling this function. And whenever you call a function as a programmer, as a Python programmer, especially, you know, you need to put these little parentheses. So if you do, you'll get an error. Well, you won't get an error. It just won't work right as we just saw. So just remember to keep those off of there when you're using the command for buttons. And that's pretty much it. Now, uh, I think you can also change the color of buttons. It's been a while since I've done this because who changes the colors? but I think it's FG, foreground color. I could be wrong. So let's try, well, let's change this to blue. I'm not even sure this is gonna work or not. <laughs> I don't even remember, but since we're playing with buttons here, no. So let's see, what we need to do is put this in parentheses maybe. Now let's save this and run it. I should have been more prepared and actually tried this, yes. So here we have, now the text is blue, right? So that's kind of cool. Now that's FG for foreground color. We can also do, I guess, BG for background color. And let's go red. I don't know, this is gonna be pretty ugly, I think. Yeah, pull this over. Now, so now the button itself um, becomes red. You know, I don't know why you would wanna do that. Um, but if you did, you could do that. And, and the colors you, you can use, just, you know, any old color. Um, I'm not sure. Let's see. Let's play around here. I don't know if we can do like hex color codes. Let's see this. That is, oops, I'm going to close this program first and then run it again. Come on. <laughs> yeah, that looks like that worked. Is that a white button? Does that look white to you? The background color, I think that's white. Yeah, that's the only hex color code I can remember offhand. <laughs> um, what's another one? F F F F F F. Um, oh boy, I don't know. What is zero 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 zero? Is that black? I can't remember. I think that might be black. Yeah. So that answers that. Yeah, you can use hex color codes in there, so that's handy. So if you're a web developer and you're, you know, doing CSS and you're used to using hex color codes or whatever that is, I think it's hex color codes, those color codes right there with the little hashtag in front of them, you can use those in this FG and BG. So that's pretty much all I want to talk about with buttons. Buttons are pretty simple and straightforward. As we, you know, continue on with this tutorial, we'll use buttons a lot in the coming videos and we'll use a lot more complicated functions than this my click function that we used right here. Obviously this is just for example purposes to show you how to call a function from a button. Uh, but yeah, pretty simple. In this video, we're gonna talk about input boxes, how to input data into your program. Let's just run this real quick to refresh our memories. And so let's pull this over. So we get this little button if we click it, puts some text up on the screen. So that's kind of cool, but we want to expand on this and put a little like input box 
sort of like a web form, you know, where a box you can type stuff into. And then we want to do stuff with whatever we type into that thing. So that's what we're going to do in this video. So let's go ahead and close this, pull our text or our, our stuff back up. And to do an input box in Kinter, we use not an input widget, which is what you would think they would call it, but it's called an entry widget. We're entering data, right? So let's go up here to file and let's save this as entry.py. So we want to create a entry widget, right? So I'm just going to call this E, E for entry. So E equals entry, this is the entry widget, and we want this to be in root. Now there's a whole bunch of other stuff we can put in here, uh, parameters and things, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So instead of doing that, let's just E pack this guy in here and go ahead and save this. And so this is entry.py. So I'm going to pull up my thing here and let's run entry.py. Remember, this is just a, the terminal that I use. You can use any terminal. I'm in C forward slash GUI, which is the directory where I'm saving all of these files for this course. Okay, so pull this over and we see, you know, we've got this box we can type stuff in. If we click here, it doesn't do anything with this. This is from the last episode, the last video we did. So, okay, we've got an input box. That's kind of cool. Um, before we go on, let's talk about some of these parameters. So we can immediately change the size of this thing. So we can go with equals. We've seen with before, I think. And I'm just going to call this 50. So if we save this, come back and run it. You can see now our input box is quite a bit bigger. All right, so whatever size you want, you can do that. It's pretty simple. Uh, let's see what else we can do. We can change the color in the same way that we changed the, the button color. Remember FG and BG. So if we want to go BG equals, you know, I don't know, blue, right? So we save this, come back here and hit reload. Now the box is blue and the stuff we type is black. It's kind of ugly, but you know, whatever floats your boat. We can also do foreground color and let's change this to white, for instance. There we go. Save this, run it. And we get the same ugly blue, but now the text inside is white. Okay, that's kind of cool, I guess. Still a little goofy. So let's get rid of that because that is just ugly. We can also change the border width. And so let's say, I don't know, five. So if we save this and run it. Is that big enough? Can you tell? So you can see the border has sort of a raised kind of thing to it. I don't know why you would want to do that, but if you did, you could do that. So that's kind of cool. So those are sort of the, there's other parameters you can play around with. And I'm not going to really talk about them because they're, they're not as cool, right? But uh, I guess you could Google it if you're really interested. But now we want to talk about, all right, what, what can we do with text that's been entered into this form or into this input box, into this entry widget? How do we actually do stuff with it? Well, what we want to do is we can pull an e.get. And this get function gets whatever you've typed into that, that thing. So let's, let's use this with our button. So we've got this button that says click me. Instead, let's change this to enter your name, right? And we want, when this runs, we want this my click function to fire. So we've got the command right here, command equals my click. And now, so when we click the button, it'll execute. So what do we want to happen when we click the button? Well, let's go, let's just change this my label. Instead of the text, let's just type in that e.get function. All right, so let's save this and run it and see if that works. Pull this over. All right, enter your name, John. Boom, John. All right, so it's kind of cool. Now we can do sort of Pythonic things with this if we want. If we want to get crazy, we can type in, you know, hello, and then a plus sign to concatenate it in. This is just pure Python. This is not a Kinter thing, right? We know how to conc concatenate, you know, smush two things together with Python. So we can do that. So let's run this. Somebody is texting me like crazy. So type in John. Hello, John, right? So 
that's kind of cool. Uh, we can also, you sort of looking at this, this area right here is getting a little crazy, right? So right up here, or really anywhere inside our function, if we want, we can say, um, we can call a hello variable, right? And we can say hello equals, then the text, hello, and then we can concatenate e dot get, just like that. And then down here, we didn't really talk of this, about this in the past, but you can type in variables for your text fields, as long as they're not, uh, let's see, in quotation marks. If you put them in quotation marks, it's just a string, and it's gonna treat it as a text string. But if you do it like this, it's a variable. So now if we save this, and run it. We see enter your name, John Elder. Let's get fancy. Let's do the last name. Hello, John Elder, right? And if we keep doing this, cool. So pretty simple, pretty straightforward. That is how you do that. Now, one last little thing that I, I didn't talk about. We can go E dot insert, and then now we want to give this an index number zero. We don't need to talk about that. There's only one. There's only one box. It's the zeroth box, and we can now give this a default value. We can say enter your name. All right. So if we save this, what this will do is this will put some uh, default text inside of the text box. Right. So. You know, a lot of times if you go to like a web form, it'll say, you know, email inside the little box where you're supposed to type in your email or whatever. It'll say username inside the box. If you want to do something like that, you can run this. And then here it says enter your name, right? So then you would want to do that. Hello, John. So uh, pretty, pretty simple, pretty straightforward, pretty easy as everything has been so far in tkinter. So now, all right, we can create a program. We can have input boxes so we can enter data in. We can click a button. We can now do stuff with that, you know, programmatically behind the scenes. We can then output based on what we typed in. So we've got really the basis, the fundamentals of almost any program. Like, what does any program do except for take in data, do stuff with it, and then output it? And here we have everything you need to know to do that with Kinter and a graphical user interface using Python. So very, very simple, very straightforward. It's less than 20 lines of code. And we've got a fully functioning program that actually does something. Now it does something stupid, it just enters a name onto the screen. But hey, you know, you can take just this and really make any kind of program you want, right? Say you want to create a stock quote program. Well, enter the stock quote, right? We could just change this to enter your stock quote, right? If we save it, run it again, enter your stock quote. So if I type in, you know, uh, Facebook and then click the button, it says, hello, Facebook, but how easy would it be programmatically behind the scenes to instead of just print hello, Facebook on the screen to take that Facebook stock quote, connect to a third party API, get the stock quote, bring it back and put it, put the current stock price on the screen. It'd be pretty simple to do that. In fact, we're going to start doing things like that in the next few videos as we play around with this. Um, but that's really, really cool. And just so just that easy to create really cool programs with this. In this video, we're going to put everything we've learned so far sort of together and create a very, very simple calculator. This is the calculator we're going to create in this video. And you can see all it does is add. So we can go four plus two equals six. It doesn't subtract, multiply, divide yet. We'll do that in the future. In this video, I just want to do the very basics, get the graphical user interface, the stuff here going on, uh, just do a simple addition and things like that. So we may finish this whole thing in this video, or we may have to break it up into a couple. We'll just have to see. And you can see this is just a very, very basic. We're using buttons here, um, like we've learned a couple of videos ago. It's not fancy looking. We've got an input box with some raised borders like we learned how to do in the last video. You know, just very simple, but it's it's a program. We can build it and uh, should be cool. So I'm going to go to the program we made yesterday and let's just save this as calculator. Okay, so 
right off the bat, we haven't looked at this yet, but you see up here it says simple calculator. That's the title. Let's go ahead and close this. And to, to change that on any program, we just type in root and then dot title and then just type in whatever we want. So we can go simple calculator, right? So that'll work. Okay, so right off the bat, we can start to use some of this stuff we've already used in the past. Let's get rid of this pack stuff. We're not gonna be packing anything anymore. We're gonna be using a grid system. So let's just use this, this entry text box that we used in the last video and just sort of expand a little bit. Now, uh, I wanna make this with 35. And let's give this a border width, width equal to five. Okay. So now we want to slap that up on the screen. So let's go E dot grid as we already know how to do. And we want this in the very first row and column, the very first column. And now we want to do a couple of things. We want to give this a column column span of three. And that's because underneath this input field, there's going to be three buttons and each button will be in a column. So we want this column or we want this text field, this entry field to span all three of those. Right. And I'm not sure if we talked about that in the last video or not, but you can, you can do that like that. Now let's give this some padding. We want to go pad X equals, let's go 10. And let's go pad y equals 10. Okay, so let's save this and let's just run this real quick Oops. just to see if it worked. Python calculator.py. Pull it up. And so far, so good. It says simple calculator. Uh, it says enter your name. That's from the last video. We'll, we'll take that off here. All right, so, so, so far, so good. Let's look at this. Uh, let's just get rid of this. There we go. In fact, we could probably just comment this out. We really don't need that. Okay, so now we need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, at least nine buttons, right? So let's, I think we can get rid of this. Okay, so let's go, let's call them button underscore one. And each button will be button two, button three, button four. It's an easy way for us to keep track of that. And so we want this to be a button and we want it to go in root and we want the text of the button to say one, right? Now we want to make the button bigger. So let's go pad X and let's give this a 40 and let's go pad Y and give this a 20. You can make these any size you want. Now we're going to have to give this a command and let's call this um, button add, right? So we need to create a button add. So let's go def button underscore add. Uh, let's just put that for now. Okay, so that will work. So let's just we need nine of these, right? Well, 10 actually, because we need a zero. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Okay, so we'll just come through here and this will be button two, button three, button four, button five, button six, button seven, very exciting, right? Button eight and button zero. And same thing, go through here and change them two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero. Okay, so we've created our buttons, pretty simple. Uh, we also need Let's see, we need a, a plus button and an equal to button and a clear the screen button. But we'll, we'll work on those in just a bit. First, let's start slapping these up onto the screen. Now, I'm gonna pull up just a regular calculator that comes with your computer. And you can see regular calculators start with seven, eight, nine, four, five, six, and then end with one, two, three. So we wanna do sort of the same thing. So, and let's comment here and say, uh, put the buttons on the screen, right? And up here, maybe we'll go uh, define buttons. It's always good to comment your code. I'm very lazy at it, as you can see. Okay, so let's go button underscore, oops, too, 
two T's button underscore one dot grid. And now we want this to go row equals column equals. And we'll fill these in in a bit. So button one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. So well, let's just go two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I guess we need one more. Zero. Okay. So where do we want these to go in the row grid system, right? Well, button one, two, three, those go on the bottom. Well, let's start at the top here. So the very top row is button seven, eight, and nine. So seven, eight, and nine, that'll be a row one, row one, and row one right? All in the same row. And then column, column zero, column one, column two. In fact, all of these can go zero, one, two, zero, one, two. Okay, so four, five, six, those are in the middle, the next row down. So that's row two, two and two. And finally, the last row is button one, two and three. So that's row three, three and three. Uh, finally, then we want row four, and then column zero. So let's save this and run this guy and see how that looks. Oh, we got an error. Uh, my click. Is that something from the old? Let's pull this back up. Where does it say my click? Oh, this old button. Let me get rid of that. All right, save this and run this guy again. Okay, so it's looking pretty good. The buttons don't actually do anything yet, but they look like buttons. Starting to look like a calculator, right? Not bad. So what we want now is to, let's say we want a clear the screen button and we want a equals to button. And we also need an addition button. So let's go ahead and create those real quick. So let's go back up here and let's create um, button underscore add. And then I'm just gonna copy all of this. And so we want this to have an addition sign in it. And actually we need to change the padding because it's a, a symbol. The, the width is a little bit different. So it's 39 instead of 40. So that works. Let's see. Um, next, we need a button underscore equal. And I'm going to do the same thing. But for the text, I'm going to put an equal to sign. And we want to make this a long button. So we're going to go 91. And we'll take a look and see what that means in just a second. So we have an addition button, we've got an equal to button. Now we need a button underscore clear. And oops, Paste this in, two equal two signs. And we want this to say clear. And we want this to be long as well. But 79 will do the trick there instead of 91. Because when it was 91, we just had one thing. Now we've got all of these characters. So taking that into account, we'll uh, put this at 79. You could put this any size you want, make it look however you want. So let's head back down here. And let's go. So we want let's go button dot clear button dot add button dot what was the other one add clear oh an equal All right uh, dot grid actually let's just copy this boom boom okay so now where do we want these to go well we can go let's see the button dot add we want this on row equals five, column equals zero. And then right next to it, we want what? Button equal maybe? So let's go row equals five, column equals one. And then here below, we want row, what are we on? Row three row four. We want the clear in row four, I guess. 
and then column equals one. All right, I think that's right. <laughs> I'm sort of starting to lose track here. Let's close this and run it again. Oh, that absolutely is not what we want. <laughs> what has gone wrong here? So zero, clear, plus and equal are on the same. So let's see what I did here in the code. So zero and what do we say? Zero and equal are on the same. Well, let's run it again. I've lost track. <laughs> so zero and clear go together. Let's just do that right now. So zero and clear are both on row four. That seems right. And then add and equal are both on row five. That seems right. Add and equal, add and equal. Huh, what has gone wrong here? Oh, I know. Since these buttons are spanning two columns, we need to put call spans of two um, into each one. So where are we up here? We use this column span. We need to do the same thing for the, let's see, the clear and the equal to. So clear needs a, paste this in column span two. And what was the other one? Equal to, and equal equals call span two as well. So, okay, save this. Let's run this again, and hopefully that will do the trick. Boom, awesome. So now we've got this thing, it looks okay, but none of these buttons actually do anything. So let's go ahead close this and let's look through here. Here we have button add. Let's change this from button add. We want this to be got button click, right? That makes more sense to me. I don't know what I was thinking. So we'll just oops, go through here and change these real quick. Boom, 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 da -da. Okay, so and then up here, we need to change this from button add to button click. Okay, so when this gets clicked, we want something to happen. Now let's pass a parameter through here. And let's, let's just call this number. Now to pass a, uh, pass a parameter into a function normally, you would just go like this and then, you know, and then and do that, right. But you can't because we can't use these parentheses. If you remember back when we first learned about buttons, you can't pass parameters with these buttons like that. But you can do it, it just takes another sort of thing. So what we need to do is something called a lambda, we use a lambda. So it's a L A M B D A, and then lambda and then a colon. And then you can do your thing, right? Like that. So let's go through here and change each of these to that. A little bit new here, but oops. There we go. Two more. Now what we want to pass into each one of these is what the button number is, right? So for button one, we want to pass in one for button two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then zero. And then these we'll deal with later. So now let's just take what we've passed through here. And then just first things first, we want to delete what's already in the box. Right. And then we want to insert so e dot insert I learned how to do this the other day, whatever that number was onto the thing, right. And I think that's all we want to do. So let's save this and run it. And see if that worked. So we have seven, eight, nine, two, two, one, three, five, six. Now if we want to do like a bigger number 55, that becomes a problem, right?
we can only sort of enter one thing at a time this way. So we need to take that into account with our code here. So it's pretty simple. Instead of deleting what was already in there, we can just go, well, we could just leave it like this, save this and run it. It's not ideal. It may not even work. I'm not sure. Let's see. So five, eight, seven. See what's going on here? Say I want to put in the number. Let's close this and run it again. Say I want to put in the number 108. 108. Well, it says 801, right? So we need to fix that. Head back over to our code and we want to look at button click and oops, come back. And what we have here is we need to insert the number plus whatever's already in there. So let's create a variable and let's put, let's call it current, the current thing that's in there. And we'll put that equal to E dot get. Remember we learned how to do this a few videos ago, right? So now we can kind of combine these. So we want the current one to be listed first. So we'll go current and then plus number. Now this gets tricky because the plus will concatenate, but it also adds, right? So if we're talking about numbers here, we need to make sure that these are strings and not integers. So I'm just going to go, I'm going to call a string function and we can make sure that this is a string probably already is, but this one we want to absolutely make sure is a string because we're passing it in as an integer. If you come down here, you can see these numbers, these are numbers. If we were passing it like this, we could leave it like this and we wouldn't have to convert it to a string because that is a string. So however you want to do this, I'm going to leave it like this and uh, just put it like this. So let's go ahead and do this. Now, We'll save this and run it, but there's going to be a problem and I'll, you'll see what that is right away. So if we go, say we want 15, one, five, it becomes one, five, one. And if we do seven, now it's one, five, one, seven, one, five, one, because it's not deleting what's in there first, um, which we need to do that before we then put the new number on. Does that makes sense. So to do that, what we want to do is after we make this current variable and we don't really need to create a variable for this, we could have just put E dot get right here and that would have worked, but I like to do it this way. Uh, before we do that, we need to sort of do a, a delete thing. So let's go E dot delete. Oops. And we want to delete if I could type, there we go. We want to delete everything that's in there. So we've done this before. We just go zero and then call it end. So this should work. Let's run this again. Put this up, run it. Hopefully this will do it. So 105. All uh, right, 105, eight, seven, five. Okay, so that seems to work. So what do we want to do next? Well, this clear button, it would be nice if that worked. So let's just knock that out real quick. This is really simple. And in fact, we already did this right here, right? So uh, we just need to put this in a, a function. So let's come down here to our clear button. And right now it's calling button.click. So let's change this to button.clear, right? So now we need to create this function. Let's just do this up here. Let's go uh, define button clear. We don't need to pass anything into it. Some space there, and all we need to do is e dot delete. Boom. So let's save this and run it just to make sure that worked. So we're getting five 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 eight nine six. Clear. That didn't work at all. Hmm. Error button object is not callable. Hmm. Oh, you know what? We really don't need a lambda this thing. We can just go command equals clear. Let's try this, see if that works. Zoop. Pull this over, 5558, five, five, clear. 
666985. Clear. Okay, so that seems to be working. Uh, let's clear the screen. Okay. So what do we want to do next? Well, let's... I guess the only thing left to do is really dive into these two. Now, this gets a little bit tricky. It's not bad, but there's a lot of different ways you could do this. And to tell you the truth, I didn't put a whole lot of thought into it. <laughs> I just did with the very first thing that I could think of. Uh, so you could probably do it more elegantly, but we'll do it this way just to see. So what we need to do is come down to our add button. And right now we're doing button.click. So let's change this to button.add. All right, so we need to define button underscore, I keep calling it dot underscore add. And all right, let's do that. Now, here's the process. Like, let's run this thing again. Just to sort of talk about my logic here. So let's say we want to add two plus two, right? Well, when we do that, when we click the two, it needs to read that into the memory of some sort. So it needs to remember that we put two in there, right? And when we click this, it needs to clear this so that we can type in the next number, right? And then when we hit equal, it has to take whatever we've written in the second time and add it to that thing that it remembered from the first time. That makes sense? So if we enter a two and click here, it has to remember two because then when we add four to it, then it has to take the four and add it to that first thing. And since we're dealing with functions here, variables can't really be passed from function to function. We're calling two different functions, the add function and the equal function. So how do we pass those numbers? Well, we can use a global variable. So that's what I'm gonna do. So to do that, we would just come on over to our, oops, where'd our code go? back. There we go. So our button add. One thing we need to do is pass uh, a number. Let's call this the first number. It's the first number somebody types in, right? So over here in button add, we need to pass e dot get, right? Or we could come up here and instead of passing that number, we could just pull it ourselves, e.get. So I think instead, yeah, let's do that. It'll be a little simpler. I'm just making this up as I go, you can tell. <laughs> okay, so instead of this whole thing, we don't even need the lambda anymore because we're not gonna pass anything. We're just gonna call the button add function. Okay, so let's call this first underscore number and set that equal to e dot get. And then we need to make sure that it's a number, right? So, well, we can do that in a bit. Right now, we need to create a global variable. So we'll call global. And let's, instead of first number, I'm just gonna call this uh, f num, first num, for first num, right? And we need to then assign something, oops, F underscore num. Ah, stop doing that. <laughs> okay, so now we need to assign that something. So let's go F num equals, and let's call, we, we need to make sure this is an integer, and let's call first number, All right? So now F num is a global. We can use it outside of this function, and uh, that'll work, right? So let's go ahead and then clear that text box. Remember, we need to do that. So we'll do the same thing we've done before, E delete, and then zero and END. Okay, so let's save this and run it. We won't be able to see if it works, but we'll be able to see if it's working. Uh, let's see, at least. So if we go five plus, okay, it disappears. Okay, so that's working. So now, the only thing that's left to do is to uh, do our equal to one, right? So let's come down here to our Lambda section. 
So button equal right here. And change this from button click to button equal. And same thing, I don't think we need to send anything through a lambda. We can just call the button equal function. So let's come over here and define button underscore equal. Okay, so what do we want to do? Well, first things first, we want to grab a variable and let's call this second underscore number and set that equal to e dot get. Right? So this is gonna oops, this is gonna pull in whatever's sitting in that thing in the text box, right? So now we need to do we need to let's go ahead and e dot delete just to make sure and that there's nothing sitting in that box. Now we need to let's create a variable called answer. Well, we don't even really need to do that, do we? We can just sort of e insert. Let's go e dot insert. We've done this before. So we, same thing zero. And now what do we want to insert? Well, we want to insert the answer. And the answer is our f underscore num plus uh, let's say, make sure this is a variable or uh, an integer. Second number. Does that look right? So f num is our global from our button add. Yep. And then second number is that. Now again, we could just do this e get instead of putting into a variable, but I like to put it in a variable. It's easier to read. Um, come back later. We can figure it out easier if we've forgotten. Okay, so let's save this and run it. I have no idea if this is going to work, but it should. So let's go five plus two. It should be seven, right? Seven. Ah! <laughs> uh, let's let's keep going. Plus three equals ten. Uh, plus eight equals eighteen. Clear eight plus two equals 10. Pretty cool. So again, this is a very, very simple calculator. It's just doing one stupid thing, adding. If we want to multiply, divide, do all the other things, subtract, it becomes a little trickier because we have the same equal to button. And if we look at our code, the equal to, how does the equal to button know if you're subtracting or adding or multiplying? How does it know? So now, when we go say five plus two, we hit the equal to sign, it adds. Well, the equal to sign knows to add because it's the only thing to do. So we're saying just add, but we're going to build out different buttons for division, subtraction, multiplication. And when that happens, so if we go two uh, times five, for instance, and then hit equal, how will the equal to button know we want to actually multiply or divide or subtract or add or whatever? That's the real big thing we need to look at in this video. And it's pretty easy. We've already sort of seen the solution when we use these globals. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to create a new global and we're going to pass addition. We're going to pass multiplication. We're going to pass whatever it is we're doing for each one. And then we'll do an if statement just to go through the equal to button. And it'll say, if it's addition, do this. If it's subtraction, do that, etc. So before we do that, we need to build a bunch of more buttons. So I'm just going to copy this add. And let's just come down here and we need three more. So let's call one of them subtract and then multiply. If I can, <laughs> oh my lord, what happened there? Multiply, there we go. <laughs> and then divide. And then up here, we need a new command. We need um, button, let's call it button subtract and call this button multiply and call this button divide, right? Okay, so we need to also change these. So instead of the addition sign, we need subtraction. Uh, let's use this star for multiply and for divide like that. No, nah, let's go that. That's the sort of divide sign, right? So, okay, that looks pretty good. So now we need to come down here to our grid system and let's see, where were we? 
button equal to, that's row five. So it looks like we need um, button underscore what? Uh, subtract maybe, dot grid. And then we want row, what? Row six, I guess. And then column uh, equals zero, no column span. So I'm just gonna copy this two times. And instead of subtract, we have what? The next one, let's go multiply. And this one will be divide. So row six, column one and column two. Okay, so let's save this. Oh, wait, first we need to we'll get an error. Otherwise we need to create these button subtract, button multiply and button divide um, functions. Let's just go button subtract. For now, let's just go return. And same thing here. Well, actually, we can just copy this whole thing. Two more times instead of subtract, we want multiply. And here what divide? Sounds about right. Okay, so let's save this, give this a run just to see that, you know, oops, actually, we need to close the old one. There we go. Run it again. Oops. Button subtract invalid syntax. What did, oh, <laughs> got the define. It's Friday, people. That's, this is how we this is how we do Friday here in Vegas. All right, save. Now let's run this. All right. So okay, this doesn't look great. This needs to be a bit bigger. Let's just do that. So the subtract one needs to be a little bigger. So subtract, where are we at? Subtract padding, let's go 40. Save this. And it's just sort of what you do with Kinter. You kind of mess around. Okay, it's still not quite. So let's go 41. And here we go. So save this. Cancel. Run. Okay, so. Eh, it's not great. And there's a lot of space there. So let's add one and one to each of these. So instead of 39, let's go 40. And let's go 40 for this one too. Save this. Run it again. All right, that's looking much better. These things are lining up mostly. Let's go one more for the divide one just to see. 41, lucky number 41. So pull this up. Okay, that's looking pretty good. I think we'll just leave it like this. Now these buttons don't do anything yet. We need to actually build that functionality into it. So first let's go up here to our button add, right? So here, let's create our new global. We want a global and we want to call it math. And for button add, we want math to equal, let's say addition, right? So everything else pretty much stays the same, right? So let's come up here and let's just copy all of this to our subtract. And here, instead of addition, let's call this subtraction. But everything else is gonna stay the same, right? I think so. Finally, not finally, but for multiply, let's go multiplication, right? And then for division, let's call this division. Okay, so I think that will work. Now we need to sort of play around with our, what do we call it? Let's look here, button click. Uh, what do we got? What's it's the equal to button equal. So where is our button equal? There it is. So here, this is what it used to be, right? We just take this number, which probably will stay the same. And then we delete, which probably will stay the same. And then we insert the two numbers together, f num, which is the first number, and then whatever the second number is. And before we just had this add, right? Obviously, we can't do that anymore, because 
depending on which button is clicked, division, multiplication, subtraction, or addition, it'll do those things. So how do we do that? Well, we need a basic if statement. So very simple, just if math equals, remember two equal two signs for conditional statements. Uh, and then what's the first one? Let's call it addition. Then if that's the case, we want to do what we did before, right? Just add the two together and then pop it up on the screen, right? So that seems to work. So let's just copy this a few more times. Oops, there we go. One, two, three, four. Does that seem right? So addition, let's call this one subtract. Subtraction, if I can type. <laughs> multiplication, and you can see how the text editor is filling this in, and division, and we don't need this one, one too many. Okay, so subtraction, we're going to subtract. For multiplication, we're going to multiply, and for division, we're going to divide. All right, so is that gonna work? I think that'll work. Let's fire this thing up and take a look. Let's see what I did wrong. Almost certainly something. So let's go two plus three equals five. Yes. Let's go two times five equals 10. Yes, that works. Let's go 10 minus three equals seven. That seems to work. And let's go 10, whoops, clear, 10, divided by two equals five. And notice it's 5.0, it's converting this to uh, a float, which is kind of weird, but necessary because look, if you clear this and go 10 divided by three, right, the answer is 3.33335. It's definitionally a, a decimal number, so it converts it to a float for us, which is kind of cool. So, all right, I think that works. Right now, this is ugly, right? I understand that we didn't put a lot of thought into making it look good, but you can do that. Go through here, make the buttons different sizes, different colors. You know, I like to pull up the calculator that comes with Windows, right? So maybe as we haven't talked about how to make menu stuff, maybe we'll talk about that in the coming up videos here, but maybe try and make it look like this if you can, for the most part, right? See if you can do it. There, look, there's other things here. There's square root, there's percentage, looks like, fractions, all kinds of stuff. So maybe as an exercise, see if you can make yours look like this and act like this. That'd be kind of cool, right? So I'll leave that to you. I'm more of a coder guy, not really a design guy, so mine looks kind of stupid, but I think you understand the functionality and how to do these things with the code. And this is a really simple way. There's probably lots of different ways you can tweak this equal to button to work, but just off the top of my head, I was like, oh, I'll just do an if statement. That'll be quick and easy, right? Uh, so that's what we did. Created our global and uh, just kind of works. We're gonna look at icons, images, and exit buttons using Kinter and Python. Okay, so we finished up our calculator app. Let's create a new file. And I just put the basic, you know, Kinter startup code that we've always used. And let's go ahead and let's see, save this as, what do we wanna save this as? Doesn't really matter, let's just call it images. Okay, so first thing you'll notice, I put the title as learn to code at codemy.com, put whatever you want. So now the first thing we wanna do is add an icon. And by icon, let's see, can we just run this real quick? So let's go Python, what do we call this? Images.py. So right now, this little feather, that's an icon, right? That's the little, the little image that's up at the top of every program you've ever seen. So here's our, goo, our uh, terminal thing, there's a little icon up there. Here's our Sublime text editor, there's a little icon up there. All Windows type programs have little icons at the top. So how do we do that? Well, I've taken an icon, which is a, an ICO file, .ICO. It's basically a PNG file that's usually like 16 by 16 in width and in height, or 32 by 32, or 64 by 64. It's, you know, it's a square thing. And uh, usually you create them using Photoshop or whatever. I'm not gonna talk about how to create them in this video. I'm gonna assume you have one and you're ready to use it. So how do you use it? Well, it's pretty easy. Just right up here at the top, 
I like to put it right underneath the title. Let's just go root dot icon bitmap, B I T M A P. All right, so that's what we're calling an icon bitmap. And then you just pass into the parameters the location of the file. Now I'm going to put this, mine is in C, uh, let's see, you know, forward slash GUI. I put it in the same directory and I called it codemy.ico. Remember, these are icon files. So if we save this and run it, and let's pull it over. You can see now we have the little Codemy icon. This is the same icon that I use on my Codemy website. Uh, on the website, it's called a favicon. In real life, using programs like this, it's called just an icon. So very, very simple, very, very easy to do. And uh, that's that. So what else do we want to do? Let's now very quickly talk about uh, an exit button. I'm not sure if we looked at this earlier, but it's really easy. Let's just create a button like we've always done. I'm going to call it button quit. And it's going to be a button and we want to, oops, where we go? And we want to put it on our root thing. And then the text for this, I'm just going to type uh, exit program. All right. And now the command is root dot quit. So root is obviously this root instance of this TK class that we've created. Anytime we do anything, we, we call root, right? You just throw a root dot quit. Python is an object oriented language, so we can do object oriented things like putting a dot and then some other thing on it. So that's how you do that. So now we can just go uh, button quit dot. Let's just pack it in there. All right, so let's save this and run it. Boom. Grab it and pull it over. So we have, you know, just this one little button. And if we click it, boom, the program ends. Very, very simple, very straightforward. So that's all I'll say about that. Let's push this down to the bottom here. Now I want to talk about using images and using images. At first, it's a little tricky because you have to import some things and you have to do some stuff. So Kinter has a built in system for using images and you don't have to import anything. You could just do it, but it only supports two image types, uh, GIF, GIF, which nobody uses anymore and some other thing that I don't even remember, PNM or something like that. It doesn't matter, it's an obsolete image, you're never gonna use it. So to use real images like JPEGs or PNG files, we have to import a whole other module and then do some a little bit of voodoo. So the thing we need is called PIL, and PIL stands for Python Image Library. And it's old. And it doesn't really work anymore. So there's a new one called pillow. It's a fork of pill that they improved upon. So we're going to use pillow and we need to install pillow, but we'll reference it here as PIL. I'm not sure why that is it's kind of weird. So you would think it would be from pillow import and then the thing, but it's not. It is from capital P capital I capital L and we want to import image TK and you go capital T lowercase k and also image. Oops, image. Okay, so that's how we reference it, but we have to still now install this on our system. So we do that on the command line and we install this like we install anything. I'm going to go pip install. Pip is the Python package manager thing, right? It comes with Python. And if this doesn't work, it means you didn't install Python correctly when you installed Python. When you install Python, there's a little screen that pops up right at the beginning that says uh, add Python to path and you need to check that box. If you didn't, pip won't work. If you did, pip will work. So if this doesn't work for you, you're gonna have to uninstall Python, go back and reinstall it and check that box. Or you can Google how to add Python to path windows and um, you know, you'll see a tutorial on how to do it manually. So pip install and we want to install pillow P I L L O W capital P I think. So I've already installed it. So I'm getting a thing that says it's already been installed. You will get something else that shows it installing a little thing will pop up on the screen and like, you know, downloading type deal. So we can make sure this has been installed by running pip, uh, pip freeze, F R E E Z E. And if we look through here, all those things I have installed, there is pillow right there. So, okay. So that seems to work. Let's clear the screen here. So now we've installed it, we're referencing it from our program here. 
how do we actually use this thing? Well, it's a little bit more complicated than normal, but just this is like one extra step. It's pretty simple. So I'm going to create an image. I'm going to call it image IMG, or let's just call it my IMG, right? And it's going to be an image TK dot photo image, right? So that's sort of similar things we've seen before, like with button, we call the button well, here, we're calling the image TK because that's this thing here. And then inside of that, we're calling dot photo image, right? So in here, we want to go image dot open, because we're going to open the image, and then just pass in whatever your thing is. Now, I have a, a picture called Aspen dot PNG, and I uh, copied it to our GUI directory. So if we pull this up. So this is the directory where we've been saving all our Kinter files in, right? So here's that icon that I saved, I saved it into this folder. And here's Aspen, I saved it into this folder. So since it's in this folder, I don't have to put this stuff on there. In fact, I really don't need to put this stuff there either. I just did it to show you. So since it's in the same file or in the same folder as the program, we could just leave it like this. So right, Usually everything in Kinter is a two step process, we define the thing, and then we put the thing on the screen. So this is a three step, a three step process, we define the image, and then we put the image in something else. And then we put that something else on the screen. So you can add images to just about every widget in Kinter, I think, I think you can add them like to buttons, make them the background of a button of a text box, a text box of anything. So I'm just going to use, um, I'm just going to call this my label, we create a, a little label and set this equal to a label. We've done this before. And then inside of here, it's a little bit different. We're just going to go image equals and then my, oops, my image, right? So now we've sort of defined this label. Now we need to just put this label up on the screen so we can go uh, my, oops, my label dot pack, pack it up there. Okay, and that should work. So let's go ahead and run this guy. Oops. There we go. And it worked. Here we go. This is a picture of me and my husky Aspen. She is a hurricane. <laughs> and that's pretty cool. So it's just that easy to add images to your uh, In this video, we're going to create this cool image viewer. And it's just it's a pretty simple image viewer. But you can see we got buttons, we can scroll around through different pictures, we can go forwards, we can go back, uh, the button disables when we get towards the end. And it's pretty cool. Okay, so I've created a new file. And this is basically just the code that we worked on in the last video that shows one image up on the screen. The big change I made was I created this images directory inside of our GUI directory. And the reason why I did that is because we're gonna have a lot of images in this program. So when you have more than one image, it's always a good idea to create a separate folder for those images. And if we pull this up, we can see here it is just the images. And I've put a bunch of images, just random pictures in there. It looks like I've got five of them. And we'll take a look at that in just a bit. So I'm gonna come up here and let's save this new file as what viewer.py. Sounds good. And let's run Python viewer.py and see what we have. We just have it looks like just that image looks like I forgot even to put the exit button on there. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. Well, we'll do that in just a minute. So in the last video, we just had one image, right? So it's pretty simple to work with one image. And that's just this image right here. Oops. Now we want a whole bunch of images. So I'm just going to copy this. And let's go two, three, four, five. And I'm going to name them image one, two, three, four, five, just to make it easier. And so the images are Aspen and Aspen one, no Aspen two, and then me one, me two, and me three, if I can type <laughs> three. All right, so there's lots of different ways to sort of scroll through things. But in Python, a really easy way is just to use a list. So that's what I thought we would do here. And I'm just going to call this an image list. 
and then set this equal to, and it's just gonna be a basic Python list. And let's go my underscore image one. And I'm just gonna copy this and paste it two, three, four, five times. Okay, so then we need to change this to two, three, four, and five. And you're probably familiar with Python lists. If we wanna access an item in the list from now on, we can just call image underscore list and then the number of the thing. And remember, lists start at zero. So this is the zeroth item. This is the first item, second, third, fourth. So if we want, say for instance, this one, that would be zero, one, two, we would call image list two, right? So very easy way to sort of scroll through any sort of list of things. That's why it's called a list. And this will make it a lot easier for us to cycle through those as we click the buttons. We'll just, we'll just access the next item in the list. So that'll be pretty easy. So, okay, so we've got this my label and it's my image. We start out with my image one since we changed the, the name of this. And instead of pack, we don't wanna pack anymore since we're doing more than one thing. Let's create a grid and let's go row equals zero, column equals zero. So we want this to be the very first thing. And we want this to go column span equals three. And the reason why we're gonna do that is because below the image, we're gonna have three buttons, a back button, a quit button, and a forward button. And each of those buttons will be on its own column. And we want the image to span all of those columns. So, okay, that's pretty good. Now let's create our buttons as well. Do we wanna create our buttons right here? No, let's do the buttons down here. We'll see why in just a minute here. So what do we need? We need a back button and a forward button and an exit button. So let's go button underscore back and set that equal to a button. And we want it in root and we want the text to equal what? Two back arrows, I think. Now we're gonna have a command for this, but we're gonna put that in just a minute. So let's go this and this. So this, let's call this middle one button exit. And let's call exit program. And for here, we want the command to be what? Root dot quit. We learned how to do this in a previous video. And then for the last one, we want button, let's change the name of this to forward. And we want this to have arrows going forward. And like I said, these are gonna have commands, but we'll mess with those in a minute. Now let's put these on the screen. Let's go button um, back dot grid. And then what row equals one, column equals zero, because our image is row zero. So below that is row one. And so button underscore exit dot grid. That will be row one, column equals one. And then finally button underscore forward dot grid. We want this to be row equals one and column equals two. Does that look right? So let's save this and give it a quick run to make sure we didn't mess anything up, which we probably did, because it's Friday here in Vegas. Okay, so we got exit program. I don't really like that capitalized. We'll change that. But right now nothing happens. The exit button works. So that's cool. So let's change this real quick to exit. Oops. Maybe spell right. Exit program. Lowercase. Okay. So, okay. We've got the framework here. Now we need to start kind of um, building in the functionality of the buttons. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a couple of functions to handle the buttons, a forward function and a back function. And Actually, let's just come up here. Where do we think we want these? Right under the label grid, let's say. So we want these to go right at the top. So let's go define forward. If I could type, and let's just return something and define back. Yeah. And call this return something. Okay, so we've got these things. Now let's head over to our button 
and let's add these commands. Command equals. Now we're going to need to pass something through these buttons because every time we click the button, we need it to know that it's the next one. So we're going to start out with, you know, a specific one. And then every time we click the button, we need to add one and then pass that through. So let's go, we need to do a lambda, L A M B D A. We've learned in the past, anytime you want to pass something through a button command, you have to do a lambda. And this is the back button. So let's call this back. And we're going to pass something or other. We don't know what yet. And for the forward button, let's go command equals lamb, lambda. And then we're going to call forward and then something. Okay, so what do we want to pass through these things? Well, actually, the first time we don't need to pass anything in the back. So let's take out the lambda. And let's just call back. Why is that? Because when we fire up the program for the first time, it'll already be on the first image. And we don't want to be able to click back. So we don't need to pass anything in that first time. So we could just leave that like this. But the forward one, we want to pass two. And we'll see why two and not why one in just a minute. But think it through like the first one, the first image is image one, right? So we want the back button, or we want the forward button to to go to the second image. So we're just going to pass two, right? So up here in our um, function for forward, let's start to build this out. So um, what do we want to call this image? Image number doesn't really matter what we call it. Now, we need to do things in this function that work outside of the function. And we've done this in the past using global variables. So we're going to do that again this time. So let's call a global, uh, all of our three things, we basically have three things, my label, global um, button forward, and global button back. And we're going to do the same thing in our back function. So I'm just going to copy these in right away. Right. So you'll see exactly why we do this in just a second. So I want to explain it. Now, the first thing we want to do when this thing gets called is we want to take the image that's already there and get rid of it. Right. So when we click forward, the next image will show up. But right now, the last image is still there. So they'll overlap. And we don't want that we want the first image to disappear. And to get rid of that, we use this grid underscore forget, it's just an internal function that um, the grid system can use to sort of get rid of something. So our image is in my label. So we're just going to sort of delete that from the screen. So let's save this and just see if that worked real quick. So let's pull this up. So here's the first image. If we click the button, boom, it disappears. So, so far, so good. That seems to work. Now we need to tell the program what the new image should be. So that's my underscore label. And it's going to be we're just going to define the whole thing all over again, right? So it's image equals now what image do we want? Well, we need to reference something from our list of images, our image list list. So that's this. But now which one do we want? Well, when we first click the button, we're passing in the number two. So this image number is number two, but we don't want the next number to be the same, we want it to be the next number. So that's plus, oops, there you go plus one. So the image we want to show is the current image plus one, which in this case is going to be no, it's going to be minus one, right? Yeah. Okay, so we passed in two. You would think we want the second image, but don't forget that lists start at zero. So the second item in the list, this thing is actually called the first item. So since we passed two in here, we need to subtract one to get the one one -th item which is the second item. That's very confusing, but think it through and it'll, it'll make sense, right? Okay, so that works. Now, 
we need to, strictly speaking, that should put the next image on the screen. So let's see if it does. Let's call this, we click the button, boom, did not work. Why not? Oh, because we defined the label, but we didn't actually put it up on the screen yet, right? So we can just come over here and copy this. It's going to it's going to always be the same, right? So okay, so let's save that. That should work. Uh, let's run it and see. That's why I like to run things as we're coding so you catch these little things. Boom. All right, that works. Okay. So far so good. Now, you'll notice when I click the next button again, it didn't go forward. Why not? Because we now need to update it. It's got the old one on there, the 2, right? So we need to update that. So let's do that right here. Let's call some space here, button underscore forward. And that, oops, that equals what? A button, just redefine the whole thing all over again. Root, and we want the text to equal two, oops, two forward arrows. And we want the command to equal lamb, if I can type lamb, Duh, <laughs> there we go. Lambda, we want to call the forward um, function. And we want it to be whatever this number was, plus one. Why? Because it's the forward button. And every time we click it, we want the next button to the next image to be sort of ready to go. And when you click it, boom, the next image will be ready to go in the button itself. So okay, that seems to work. Now we also need to do button underscore back because we need to update the back button as well. So that's root. The text is going to be uh, two back arrows. And the command is going to be lambda mbda. For some reason, I can never remember uh, how to spell lambda back. And then here, it's going to be, again, the image number but we want the previous one, right? So instead of plus one, it's minus one. Okay, um, that should work. Now, oops, we need to actually put those guys on the screen. So I'm gonna come down to, let's see, button back, button forward. Just copy these, because their position never changes, right? Button back and button forward. Okay, so let's save this and run it, see if that worked. So boom, 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 boom. Up, oh, last one, it disappeared. So one thing we need to also do is we need to do something to see, hey, is it the last button? Is it the last image? If so, disable it, right? So that you can't click to the sixth image because there isn't a sixth image. So we're gonna need to do that um, let's just put this right in here. It doesn't really matter. Let's go if and then image underscore number equals five. Image number is this image number that we're passing in, the, the image number, right? If that's the case, then we need our button underscore forward to equal, let's just define this as root and the text equals two forward things, and the state equals disabled. All right, so let's save this and run it, see if that worked. Boom, pulled over. So first image, second image, third image, fourth image, fifth image, and sure enough, it's been disabled, and we can't click forward, so that works. So now we need to work on this button. We haven't done anything for it yet, but it looks like our forward button is completely done. So let's come over here and I'm just gonna grab this grid forget because the same thing with the back button, we're gonna wanna delete whatever image is there before we put in the new one. And I think we can just grab all the stuff from up here and paste. We just need to make a few changes. So um, my label, that will stay the same, right? Think, yes. 
Um, the button forward will stay the same and the button back will stay the same. And that is because, let's see, let's look at our define forward. What we're doing here with the back button, we're taking whatever image number and subtracting one. So when this starts, it's already subtracted one. Now, if we click it again, we need to just subtract another one. So it, all that stays the same, I think. Yeah, <laughs> right? So then we need to just put those things up on the screen like we've done before. So I can copy this exact same stuff. Okay, let's save this and run it, see if that worked. I know we went through that fast, but so right off the bat, this is not disabled. We need to disable that off the bat. So we'll do that in a second. So forward, back, nope, that doesn't work. Forward, back. Okay, so what has gone wrong here? Back image number one, back takes zero positional arguments, but one was given. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> uh, we forgot to put our image number in there. Okay, gotta pass that that variable. So let's run this again. So forward, back, forward, forward, back, forward, forward, back, back, back. Okay, it seems to work. But oh, when we do that, it starts at the end. So we need to right off the bat, figure out how to disable that. So let's come down here to the very beginning when we very first created that back button, let's just go state equals disabled, save this, run it again. So now, right off the bat, it's disabled, so it, it won't go any further. And now this one's disabled. Now if we come back here, back, back, back. Oh, if we scroll and go back, it's still enabled. So what we need to do is the same thing we did up here. Um, we just need to do it down here. So let's pull it right in here and go if image underscore number equals and remember double equal to sign is what you use for a conditional statement. And so if that number is one, which is first one, then our button back equals, let's just find this thing again, root, the text equals two back things, and the state equals disabled. <laughs> okay, so save this, give it one more run. This should do it, we hope. So it's disabled here. If we go all, oops, where'd you go? Come back. We go all the way to the end. That one's disabled. If we go back, boom, that one's now disabled. Forward, back. Okay, so that seems to be working. And that's it. <laughs> so we went through that very, very quickly. You might have to go back and watch the video again, pause it a bunch of times. But the, the main things to sort of keep in mind is we created all of our images into a Python list. And if you're familiar with lists, it's just a normal Python list. There's nothing T Kinter about this. And every time we click a button, we're just going to reference, we're going to create a little counter and just reference the next item in that list, show it up on the screen, forget the one that was there previous. We haven't looked at this before. This is new. Everything else we've done in this video is pretty much stuff we've already learned, except for that little thing right there. And then every time, we click that button, we just need to update the buttons, which is why we created these globals so that these updated buttons will work outside of the function. And that's it. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And granted, this is a pretty cheesy little app, but I think it it's a nice little exercise and uh, yeah, pretty fun. And this video, we're gonna create this status bar here at the bottom that sort of updates dynamically as we click the buttons. So 
The status bar is actually fairly simple. We're just going to use a label. We've already used labels in the past lots of times. We know how to do that. But we're going to take a little twist to it. We're going to add a few new things that you haven't seen before in order to sort of make it look like a status label in order to update it uh, dynamically and in order to sort of stick it to the bottom of the screen like this. So to get started, let's just create a new label. I'm going to call it status and set this equal to a label. And then we want this to be in root and we want the text to equal what? Image one of five. Okay, so let's go ahead and save this. And what I've done here is I've just created a new file and I just copied all the text from our last video. If you didn't watch that video, go back and watch it to see where all this code came from. So now we can save this and I'm just gonna save it in our GUI directory, and I'm going to call it status.py. Okay, so right off the bat looking at this, this is not great, right? We're putting image one of five. How do we know there's five images? Well, we know because we just built this and we know there's five of them. But it's conceivable that you won't know how many images there are. If your program has hundreds of images or millions of images, you're not going to go through and count them all by hand. That would be crazy. If it's dynamic and you're adding more images as you go, you're not going to know how many images. So we need to figure out a way to do this programmatically without just hard coding it in there like this. So what we can do is we can call the len function, L-E-N, and that'll give us the length of a thing. And what thing? Well, we can just take our list here, our image list, and run a len on it. So let's just do that. Let's concatenate and let's call the len function. And then we just pass in image underscore list, right? Now, this will almost work, but not quite because this returns a number because it's counting how many images or how many, you know, items are in this list. And there are five. Well, five is a number and you can't add a number to a string. And this is what that is right there is the string. So we need to convert this to a string. So we can call the str function, the string function. And just pass that in. Okay, so that should work. Yeah, so let's throw this up on the screen and see if it worked correctly. So I'm gonna go down to the very bottom and let's call status dot grid. And we want this to be in row what two and column equals zero. And we want this to span all three of our columns. Okay, so let's save this and run it, make sure it worked correctly. Let's close the old one, clear the screen. Okay, so Python status.py, pull this up. And okay, so it's correctly calculated that there are five images, but you know, nothing happens yet because we haven't programmed it to. Also, it's down here at the bottom, but it's right in the middle and it doesn't have a border or anything like that. So, we need to kind of fix that. So let's close this. And let's come back up here to the top where we've defined this thing. And let's do some things. First, we want to create a background, or not a background, a border. So to do that, we can call the BD function of the widget and set this equal to one, right? We also want it to sort of look like it's sunken down a little bit because status bars usually are sort of sunken a little bit. So we can call relief. R-E-L-I-E-F, I before E, yep, except after C, and we want this to be sunken, right? So let's save this and just give it a quick run and see if it worked. Okay, it's definitely got a border and it's definitely sunken. And one thing you'll notice is there's some space between these buttons. I forgot I did that and I didn't tell you about it. So to get that, I just came down here to the very bottom of our program and I found the last button, button forward, and I added a pad Y of 10 just to give it that little 10 pixels or whatever of space between there. Because otherwise we close this and let's see, let's just take this off real quick. Save it and run it again. You can see it's scrunched right up there. So we don't like that too much. So I'm going to add this back and save it. So okay, so far so good, but it's very small and it's right in the middle. So how do we stretch it all the way across the bottom? 
Well, we need to add something called sticky. And I'm not sure if I've talked about this in other videos yet, but the grid system and pack two for that matter has a kind of a navigational system. And it's based on sort of a compass, north, south, east, and west, right? So north is up, south is down, east would be to the right, and west would be to the left. And so we can, we can tell this to stretch in any direction. So we want to stretch left to right. So that's from west to east. So to do that, we go W plus E, right? So let's save this and run it and see what that did. Okay, so very cool. It's stretched all the way across, but it's still in the middle. So how do we change that? Well, we come up here to the label and we can add a couple of things here. We can anchor this uh, underscore or un lowercase a-n-c-h-o-r. We can anchor this in a direction. So we want it to be on the right side. So we would anchor that east. So if we save this and run it, we can see sure enough, now it's over here. Very cool. If we wanted it over here, we could just change this to W for West, save it and run it. Boom, now it's over here. Very cool and uh, yeah, pretty simple. So let's go ahead and exit this and I'm gonna change this back. I like it the other way. So I'm gonna put it on East, save it. Okay, so it looks good. It's where we want it to be. It's anchored in the right spot, <clears throat> excuse me. Now we need to create some functionality. So I'm gonna copy this and what we need to do is whenever we click a button, either the forward button or the back button, we need to update our label. So I'm gonna paste this in here. Oops. I'm also gonna come down here to the bottom and grab this because we want this to update whenever we click the button. We want it to update on the screen, so we need to paste that in here. Okay, so now we need to fix this thing right here. It's showing image one of whatever. Now this part updates dynamically, that already works but this part does not. So I'm gonna delete this and I'm gonna put a quotation marks and we wanna concatenate a couple of things. So what do we want to output? Well, we wanna output whatever number that we're currently on. And luckily for us, we already have that number. We passed it into this function at the beginning. So whenever we click this button, we're already passing that number in. So I can just copy this and come down here and just paste that in here. But Remember again, this is gonna return a number, an integer, and you can't concatenate an, an integer with a string. So once again, we need to convert this to a string using the str function. I just pass that into that. Um, okay, so that should work. Let's save this and run it just to make sure that it did. I make a lot of mistakes, so I like to run things often. So, okay, two of five, three of five, four of five, five of five. Now when we go back, it doesn't update. So we need to fix that obviously. And to do that, we just need to make the same change we just made to the forward button, just need to make it on the back button. So I'm just gonna copy this, come down to the back function, paste that in there, Give some space here. And if I was a, a good coder, I'd put some comments, you know, update status bar something, right? But I'm not particularly a good coder when it comes to that sort of thing. So okay, let's save this and run it. And hopefully, so if we go forward, we're on image two, if we go back, back to image one, if we go all the way to the end, we're on image five of five. If we then go back, four, three, two, one. Okay, so seems to work. So that's at least one way to create a status bar. It's probably not the only way, but it works really, really simply and really easily. Uh, the programming to create the functionality of it is really straightforward. Really the big thing that we learned is this sticky W and E and what else? This border thing and the relief thing and the anchor thing, I guess those are sort of new, uh, but those are just basic label things really. So very cool. 
want to show you how to use frames with Kinter and Python. Okay, so I've got a new file open and I've just got the same sort of standard code that all of our projects start with. And let's go up here and save it as what? How about frame.py? Just frame. Okay, so frame.py. Now, what we want to do is create a frame. And a frame is just what it sounds like. It's a little like box, has a border. You can have a label on it or not. And it's just, it's sort of used to just keep things organized in your app. So you might have different sections that you want to sort of put together visually, and a frame is a good way to do that. So frames are really easy to create. It's just a widget like all the other widgets, and we create it mostly the same way that we create other widgets. So I'm just going to call this frame. You can call it anything you want. And it's called, the actual term is a label frame, right? So we want this in root. And let's say we want the text to equal, this is my frame, I don't know, right? Now we can also give this some padding. Let's go pad X equals five and pad Y equals five. And we'll play around with these paddings in a minute to show you exactly what they do. So now we wanna put this on the screen. So let's go frame and let's just pack this in real quick here. And Let's give this some padding. So pad X equals, let's say 10, and pad Y equals 10. And we'll see sort of exactly what this does with the padding, why this is 10 and this is five in a little bit once we get this thing built and we play around with it a little bit. So let's see, if we save this, I don't think this will actually do anything because we haven't put anything in the frame yet, but we can run this to see. Let's go Python. Notice I'm in my C forward slash GUI directory where we've been saving all our files so far. And let's call this frame.py, run it. Yeah, so let me pull this over. It doesn't really do anything yet because we haven't put anything in the frame. So that's the next thing that we wanna do. So we can do anything we want. I mean, we can put anything inside of this we want. Just for purposes of showing you how to do this, I'm just gonna create a simple button. I'm gonna call it B. <laughs> so button. This is a button widget. We've done this a zillion times already. So we want not, now normally we would say put this in root, right? Our root container. But now we don't want it in root. We want it in frame, which is this thing right here. We, we're saying put this in the frame, right? So other, other than that, it's basically the same. We could just go text equals um, don't click here, right? Uh, and then like any time we want to, add this to a thing, we could just pack this in there. Okay, so let's save this. Come back here and run this guy. And here we go. Oops, drag this over. Here we see this is my frame. And inside of it is a button that says don't click here. The button doesn't do anything because we didn't tell it to do anything. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. So notice this frame. That's kind of cool. So let's close this and run it one more time. Now let's play around with this. Remember we had different paddings, pad X and pad Y for the, the frame itself. And then when we packed it, we, we gave it some padding. So look at this. Let's pull up the code again. And pull this up here. So you'll notice when we packed it, when we packed the frame, whoops, disappeared. We gave it 10 and 10 for pad X and pad Y. And we've done pad X and pad Y before. It pads on the X axis and the Y axis. And you notice that's on the outside here because this is 10. On the inside, we put five. And you can see that's like that. So let's, let's play around with this. Let's go pad X 100 and pad Y 100 to really make this dramatic. So let's save this. Come back here and run it again. And you notice, boom, you have padding X and Y uh, as 100. So this, you know, packs it inside of the, the outside container here, right? So that's interesting. Or we could do the opposite, put that back. And let's say, oh, pad X and pad Y inside of, let's just say 50. Run this again. It's a little better. Now we've put some padding inside of the frame. So 
that's really all you have to keep in mind with this padding. When you create it, remember when we create any widgets, it's always a two-step process. We create the widget and then we put it on the screen. So in this one, we created the widget. And when we do that, when we give that thing padding, that goes inside of the frame. And then here we put it on the screen and that pad X and pad Y goes outside of the frame. So just sort of keep that in mind. Now, the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to this, and this is kind of weird, right? So check this out. Normally, we just pack things when, uh, you know, we don't care, right? Otherwise, we use a grid and then we position things. The thing about pack and grid is you can't do them both. You can either do pack and pack or grid and grid. So you notice here we did pack here and pack here. Well, with a frame, that's not necessarily true anymore. You can do a grid inside the frame. So for instance, we can go grid row equals zero, column equals zero. If we save this, now normally we would get an error if we did this, but now we pull this over and boom, it works. Now it's positioned in the same spot because there isn't another thing in there, but we can create another button to show you just to prove one last time. So we could go, I don't know, B2, and I'm just gonna copy this whole thing. And right, or here, don't click here or here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so B2.grid, we want row equals one and column equals one. So we want it down and over, right? So if we save this, run it, Boom, you see, sure enough, we can play around with the grid system inside this frame, even though for the frame itself, we packed it. Very cool, very interesting, something to definitely keep in mind. Now, one last thing, I said that that was the last thing, but we have one actual other last thing, and that's this little label right here. This is my frame. We can actually get rid of that as well, just right here. Remove it completely, and if we do that and save it, We get this, kind of a cleaner look, right? Very cool. So think of frames, use them all, the, you're probably gonna use them all the time. I mean, there's always times when you have different sections of your screen that you wanna sort of keep separate. You might have all the, the buttons on this side in a frame and all the form things on this side in a frame. And then you might have another frame where there's images or who knows what, but sort of separating things out visually is always a good idea. And uh, that's how you do it with frames. In this video, I'm gonna talk about radio buttons, which is, are just these sort of round buttons with text next to them. They're used for forms and all kinds of other things, very useful. And they're a little bit trickier than some of the other widgets we've looked at in the past. So we'll go ahead and take a look at that in this video. And I've created a new file, I called it radio.py, saved it into our GUI directory where we've saved all of our code in the past. And this is just the basic sort of uh, starter text that we've used in all the other courses to create just a basic, uh, you know, framework with Kinter. So what we're going to use is a radio button widget. And to do that, we just call radio button. And then much like some of the other ones we've done in the past, we will go root. And then for the text, we go equals. Um, let's go option one. And here's where it gets a little bit different. We're going to create a variable. And Kinter has sort of its own variables, Kinter variables. They're slightly different than Python variables. And I'll show you exactly what the difference is in just a minute. But we're going to assign a variable to each of these buttons so that we know if somebody clicks on the button, that gets put into the variable. So then we could take that variable and do stuff you know, with it in the future based on which button or which radio button was clicked. So this will make sense in just a bit. So uh, let's call this um, R, let's just call it R, right? You can call it anything you want. And the value, let's put this as one. So this is option one. So when somebody clicks on that, we want the value to be one because it's option one. Yeah, you can put anything you want, but we'll just do one. So we're also going to need to do some other stuff to this, but this will work just for now. Now I'm just gonna pack this on the screen. 
Usually we do two sentences or two lines of code, one to create the thing and then one to put it on the screen. But you've, we've seen in the past that we can do this all in one line just by going, calling dot pack uh, on the thing and that should work. Okay, so I'm gonna just copy this and create a second one. And we'll call this one option two and the value from this will be two. And we're just gonna pack this onto the screen. So let's see, I think that is pretty much it. Now we need to sort of define this variable. So like I said, this is gonna be a Kinter variable and Kinter variables are a little bit different. Uh, they look the same as in you just call them like you would a Python variable. But here we want this to be an integer because the value we've assigned to it is either a one or a two. And a one or a two is an integer, right? So the variable needs to be an integer variable because we want to do numbery things to it if we want to do numbery things. So we're going to call int variable and then this function. Now this function allows Kinter to keep track of changes over time to this variable. So when we click on a thing, it'll know that. And I think we've looked at this in the past with other things. In order to use this, we don't just call the R variable, we call R.get. Remember, we wanna get whatever the variable is at the moment. So if somebody clicks on a different radio button, we wanna be able to get that, right? So that's why we're using these instead of just regular Python variables. That's just a sort of a function of radio buttons. So let's see, we have one, we have two, this. Now we've done a one and a two here, right? If we wanted to pass a string into this, we could call like this, right? And then instead of integer, it's str variable. It's a string variable, right? But in this case, we wanna do integers. And after I do this one, I'll show you another way to do this because there's a couple of ways to do it. And uh, we'll see this. So let's save this as radio.py, let's open up our thing here and let's run radio.py. Oops, what have we done? Name radio button is not defined. Did I spell button wrong? Oh, I did spell button wrong. It should be lowercase b. All right, so save this, come back here and run it again. Okay, pull this over. So you see we have option one and option two, and this works, but it doesn't actually do anything. And we can't really tell if we've done anything, right? So we need to have this actually do something so that we can confir confirm that we did this correctly. So I'm going to create a, a quick label. Let's just call it my label and set this equal to a label. And we want this on root and we want the text to equal what? R dot get, oops, R dot get. Now we wanna go my label dot pack. Okay, so let's save this. Now this shouldn't work yet for a specific reason and we'll see. So right off the bat, we have zero because we haven't actually um, set this yet. And we can if we want. So we can close this, come back here, and we can go r.set. And inside of here, we could say two, for instance. So if we save this and run it. You remember these Python or these Kinter variables, you can set and you can get. I think we looked at that in a prior video. You can see now it's two. And two has been selected automatically. That's what happens when you set it, right? So if we go up here, this doesn't yet change because we haven't created a function to update this thing if it changes. So we can close that and do that right now. So let's create a function, we'll define, and let's call this um, clicked. I don't know, doesn't really matter. And now here we want to change this just paste this in here. And we wanna pass, um, I don't know, value. And now this will be value. So what we need to do is when one of these is clicked, we need to pass that into this function and then update our label. And we've seen this already in the past by using the command. We use this when we create buttons and, and 
do that. So we can go command, and we can go lambda. We've done this in the past. And so what do we want here? We want to call clicked, and we want to pass in here our r value, but we need to get it, right? So inside of here, we go r.get and pass that. So then I think we could just copy this whole thing and paste it onto the other radio button as well. Okay, so if we save this, hopefully I did that right. <laughs> it's starting to all get jumbled together. All right, so we see it's already on two because we've set it to be two. But if we click on one, boom, one appears. We click on two again, two appears. Very cool, pretty easy. And we could do the same thing with a button real quick. Uh, let's just throw a button up here and let's go uh, my button equals a button. It's in root and the text equals click me and the command equals, actually, I'm just gonna copy this whole thing. because It's the exact command that we want. That is right. Yep, I'm just counting parentheses. And then if we put this on the screen, my oops, button dot pack. All right, so we'll save this and run it real quick. We see option one. If we click it, boom, it goes to one, two. If we click it, two. Okay, so either way this works and that's how you do that. Now, in the future, anytime we want to use that value of the radio button, we can by either calling r.get or if it's inside of a function using, you know, whatever value we've passed in, whatever keyword for that. So that's cool. So that's one way to do it and this works, right? But these are just two buttons. You may have like 10 and you may not want to do all 10 of these, right? So in that case, we can sort of use a loop in order to do this. And so that's what I'm gonna do now very quickly. Maybe not so quickly, this might take a bit. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead, well, let's just comment out those. And we'll leave this for now. So what we can do now is create a Python list. And I'm gonna call this modes. And inside of here, this is just a Python list. I'm going to create some tuples for the the radio buttons that we want to create, right? So let's create, oh, I don't know, four of them. Okay. Now inside of here, we need two values. One, two. And I'm just going to copy these and paste and paste. So let's say we're creating a, a menu for a pizza place online or something, and we want to select which type of pizza we want on, or which type of topping we want on our pizza. So we might have pepperoni. We might have what? Cheese, uh, mushroom. What's another type of pizza? Onion, is that a pizza? <laughs> and then, so this is the thing that's gonna show up on the screen. This is the actual value that we're gonna pass. In here, it was this value right here when we had one and two. But instead of numbers this, this time, since we did numbers last time, integers, let's do strings this time. So I'm just gonna copy this. We want the value to be the same thing as the thing. Oops. So copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. And modes, I called it modes because it's the it's a mode of a radio button. You can call this anything you want. If you wanted to call it toppings, you could. Um, I would call it something plural, and we'll see why in just a second. So now let's get rid of this and this from the old thing. Now, just like in the last time, we need to set up a, a Python, a Kinter variable. So instead of calling it R, what should we call it? Let's call it pizza. And this time it's a string variable, str. I think that'll work. Actually, I think it's string variable, string var. Oops, pizza. Yeah, so let's do that. And we want to set the first one 
dot set. We'll set that to what? Let's let's make the first one pepperoni. Okay. Oops. So now we need to loop through all of these things and put them on the screen. So I'm gonna go for text and mode in modes. This is just a basic loop, right? And we want to create a radio button. So let's go radio button like we did last time. And then we want this in root, of course. Now, remember last time we created a text, a variable and a value, we need to do the same thing. So this time the text will equal text, because we're calling text. In our loop, we're calling on well, this needs to be all capitalized modes. So we're going to loop through modes, which is this, and we're going to take each of these values. So this will be text and this will be uh, what did we call this one text and mode. So this will be text and this will be mode. This will be text and this will be mode. This will be text and this will be mode. So we want the first value right here text equals to text, right? And we want the variable to always be pizza. That's this thing right here, right? And we want the value in that variable to equal mode, which is this thing, this thing, this thing, and this thing, right? So, okay, now we can dot pack this. Oops. If I could type, <laughs> there we go. And that should work, right? So let's just save this real quick to see, actually, we need to change this also. Uh, and this pizza, pizza dot get. Okay, so let's save this and see if this works. Oh, we got an error. What did we do? Uh, self option, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I misspelled variable. What line? I don't know. Let's look at this. There it goes. Variable. <laughs> Variable. There we go. Cannot type today. It's Friday here in Vegas. Can't type on a Friday. Are you kidding me? Okay, so now we see we've got pepperoni, cheese, mushroom, and onion. And the first thing is per pepperoni because we set that when we started. And if we click on this, it, it goes pepperoni. If we go cheese, we click, boom, cheese. Notice it's not doing it when I click on this because this time around we didn't put a command, like here we did a command when you click on the actual button, we're not doing that this time just just to save time since we've already done it once. Now we're just doing it when you click the actual button, right? So let's see, let's take this and go anchor equals w. And let's close actually. See, these are all centered, right? We close this close this and run it again. All right. Now they're all anchored to the west, to the left. Looks better. And in fact, we can get rid of this pepperoni too, because we don't really need it at the moment. So down here on our label, in fact, we can just get rid of this if we want to, right? Oh, that's the button. Uh, label. Label. All right, so save this, run it one last time. So pepperoni, cheese, click. Cheese, mushroom, click, mushroom, onion, click, onion. So this last time is just sort of a fancier way to do it. Just doing a simple loop. It's easier than, you know, creating four of these radio button things. We could have done that too. That, that would work. Uh, this is just sort of a little bit easier. And like I said, I called this modes. We could call this toppings. And we just change this to toppings, right? And instead of mode, maybe we call it what? Topping, topping in toppings. And we change it here to topping. Save this, give it a run to make sure I didn't screw something up there. Cheese, boom, cheese, mushroom, mushroom, back to pepperoni, pepperoni. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. 
I want to talk about creating message boxes. Okay, so I've created a new file. I called it message.py, and I've just pasted in the same starter code that we always have. So a message box is just a little like a pop-up box, right? It usually has a couple of buttons, yes or no, okay, uh, cancel, all that sort of thing. And, you know, you're going to use these a lot for a lot of different things. So to get started, we have to actually import a module to use this. So we're going to go from tkinter, import, oops, probably a good idea to spell import correctly. And we want to import message box, all one word, right? So to do this, there's actually several different ways we can do this. So first, let's just create a button. Let's go button, and we want this in root, and we want the text to be, I don't know, pop up. And then let's just pack this onto the screen. Okay, now we actually want to call a command. So when we click this, we want it to do something. And let's call this pop up. Right. So now we need to create a pop up function. So let's go define pop up. OK, so inside of this, we want to create a message box. Now, there are several different types of message boxes you can create, and I'm going to go through all of them. But for right now, the very first basic one is show info. And this one isn't interactive, I don't think. It just, you know, puts up some text on the screen. So uh, the first parameter, this takes two or three parameters. And the first one is the title bar that you want to show up. So uh, I'm just going to type, this is my pop-up, right? And then the next one is the message that we want to show in the actual pop-up. So let's just type, hello world, right? And I think that will do it. So let's save this, head over to our C forward slash GUI directory where we're saving all these files. And let's run this message.py. Uh-oh, invalid syntax. Oh, <laughs> I'm in a big hurry today. Forgot our parentheses. Okay, so save this, come back here and run this again. Let's clear the screen because who wants to look at error messages? Oh no, okay, so what have we done here? Button, text, man. All kinds of errors this morning. All right, lowercase t in text. So let's save this, try it one more time, clear this screen. All right, it actually finally worked. Okay, so we just have our little app here. Oops, it disappeared on me. And it has a button pop up. When we click this, boom, here's our little pop up. And you can see here's the title. This is my pop up. And then the actual thing itself says hello world. And it's got this little eye next to it because this is a, an info or showing info. And if we click this, it disappears, right? So that's pretty much it. And it's pretty simple. So if we close this. Now, I mentioned there are several different types of in, uh, boxes that we can create. So I'm just going to paste in this comment. And these are the different message boxes. There's the show info one, the show warning, show error, ask question, ask OK, cancel, and ask yes or no. And to use each of these, we just change this little bit right here. So instead of show info, if we want to do a show warning, we can save this and paste. So if we save this and run it, we get pop up, and then it says hello world. But now, we get this little uh, OK message, or we get this little warning thing. Now, I'm going to turn up my volume. And if we hit this again, did you hear that? We got that sort of error sound. You hear that? That comes with the warning. That didn't happen with the show info one. So OK, let's close this. Take a look at the next one. So show error. Copy this, paste it in, save it, and run this again, and pull it over. Did you hear that? That's the error warning, and you get this big angry X, right? So that's the error one. Close this, and let's see, ask question, copy, paste, save, and run. Boom. Pull this over. Okay, so now, 
It just says hello world, but we have now yes or no, right? So if we click yes, nothing happens. If we click no, nothing happens. I'll show you in a little bit what how to do things based on whether they clicked yes or no or okay or cancel or, or any of that stuff, just as soon as we go through all of these. So that was ask question. And so now let's try ask okay cancel. Save. Run. So okay or cancel, right? And again, we'll look at how to play with these buttons in a bit. Close that. And what's less left? Finally, ask yes, no. If we save this, paste, save, and run, we get yes or no. Okay, so that's cool. But now, how do we deal with these buttons? Um, let's close this. So, what we can do here is take this whole thing and just smoosh it into a variable. So we can call this variable anything, I'm going to call it response. And then we just set that equal to that. Now, we can actually print out the response and see exactly what it is. And once we know what it is, we can do an if else statement in order to, you know, do stuff depending on that. So let's create a, a quick label. And we want this in root. And we want the text to equal response. Now let's just pack this on the screen. Okay, so we save this, and we've got the ask yes or no guy on there right now. So we can run this, pull this over, see the pop up, yes or no. So let's click yes. Boom, it returns one. That's kind of interesting, right? If we click no, it returns zero. So what we could do is close this and pull up our thing. Now we know it returns a one for yes or a no or zero for no. So we can go if response equals, and you need the double equal to sign to compare. We're not assigning, we're comparing. Then we can just, let's pull this. And for the response, let's click, or let's type in, you clicked yes, All right? Now we can go else, you clicked no. So let's save this and run it. And pull this over. So hello world, yes, no. Boom, one, you clicked yes. Try it again, no. Zero, you clicked no. So let's pull this back up. This we can get rid of. Okay, so that's interesting. Now, that's for ask, ask yes, no, All right? So I'm going to can't or I'm going to comment that out this stuff and undo this. Now let's just go through these all very quickly. So ask OK cancel. We save this. Run it again. Pop up. OK or cancel. So if we click OK, we get one. If we click cancel, we get zero. So OK cancel also returns a one or a zero. Right? Uh, what do we ask? Ask question. Let's take a look at this one. Save it. Pop up. Yes, no. If we click yes, it returns yes. If we click no, it returns no. Right? So that's kind of cool. So now, if we want to play with that one down here, we have to change this to yes. Right? In fact, let's just run this to make sure that works. So save this, run it again. Zoom, pop up. Yes, you clicked yes. Pop up. No, you clicked no. Very cool. Okay, so very quickly again, let's comment this out. Comment, comment, comment. There we go. And then let's look at the rest of these. Show error. Save and run. Now I could just tell you what each of these do, but I think this is a better way because in the future, if you can't find documentation on this, you need to be able to figure out how
to determine what these things are returning on your own. And this is how you do it. So if we click OK, it returns OK. So that's interesting. What else do we have? Show error, show warning. Save. And run. Pull this over. Hello world. OK, it returns OK. And then finally, we have show info. Save it and run it. Bring it over, pop up. OK, it returns OK as well. So very cool, very easy to create message boxes. And there's like a zillion different reasons why you might want to create a message box um, for any number of reasons. And that's how you do it. In this video, I want to show you how to create new windows in your program. You know, up until now, we've just basically had one big window. We've had message boxes and little things like that. But as, as far as like creating a whole new window, uh, we haven't looked at that yet. And likely you're going to need to do that in some point in your careers. I created a new file called base.py and it just has the same, you know, starter text, starter code that we've used throughout this series. And so what we want to do here is just create a new window. So how do we do that? Well, you notice up until now we've been using this root window. It just shows one big window on the screen and uh, that's it. So, you know, likely you're going to want to add a different type of window or a different window. Uh, if you click a button, if you do a drop down thing, whatever, how do you do that? Well, you start just by defining it. I'm going to call it top and set that equal to top level. And it's just this top level function. So if we save this and run it, we get right off the bat, let me pull this over. This is our main window. There's nothing in it. And then also this second window. And you, you, we can tell the difference because the icon is different up here, right? This is just the Kinter default icon, whereas this one has our little Kodami icon, right? So, okay, that's not that great. Here we go. Come back. Let me close this. Now, anytime you want to do something in here, you just do it inside, you just do it after this. So, you know, if we wanted a label, uh, let's just call this label equals label. Now, normally we would put this in root, right? Well, now we have this top, we can put it in. So we can designate different windows that way. And we can set the text equal to hello world, whatever. And then let's just pack this on the screen. So let's run this real quick. Head back over here and run it. Oh no. Ah. <laughs> Typo already. There we go. Lowercase t. I do that a lot, I think. Seems like. It's at least the second time in this series I've done that. Okay, so now we have our main thing and then our second window. And the second window says hello world. So you can you can put anything in there you want. Uh, for instance, we could put an image in there. Remember a few videos ago, we used this image.tk thing. So we could go, let's get rid of this. And let's just say my underscore image, set that equal to image tk dot photo image. Oops. And then image dot open. And then call the image. Now I think we had we had a directory called images that we set up and inside of there I had this aspen.png picture. So we can do that and then create, let's create a my underscore label el and just set this equal to a label. We want this to be in top and we want the image to equal my image. Now we need to pack this on the screen. Okay, so that should work. So if we save this and run it real quick, boom, boom, we get our first normal window with nothing in it. And then we have this second window with uh, me and Aspen doing a little yawning here. So you notice it says learn to code at codemia.com, which is the same title as this one. We can change that too, it's pretty simple. Uh, in fact, we could just copy these two things for the title and the icon. And I'm just gonna put this right under here. But instead of root here, obviously we want top. Same thing here. Top. So if we save this, come back over here, run it again. We get our main window. 
and we get our second window and it has the icon and it says learn to code economy, which is what it said before. So let's change that real quick to uh, what we want. My second window. All right. Very creative. <laughs> All right. So now, now we get this, my second window, right? Okay. So that's kind of cool, I guess, but chances are you don't want all these windows just fly open every time you open your program. You want it to only open if you click a button or do a drop down or click a link or do something. You want to be able to control when they appear, right? So how do we do that? Well, let's create a button. I'm going to call it button. And let's call button. We want this in root. We want the text to say open second window. And then we want the command to be what? Open. Okay, so now we need an open function method, whatever you want to call them. Open, find open. Dun, dun, bump, bump. Now inside of here is where we want all this stuff, right? So now we tab all this stuff over. Oops. There we go. That seems like it should work, right? So it actually sort of will and sort of won't, and I'll show you just now. What I'm talking about. So if we save this, come back over here and run it again. Oh, you know what? Once again, forgot to pack the button. <laughs> Dot pack. It's uh, we're having a day here in Vegas. It's cloudy. It's kind of cooler than normal. My brain is just not woken up yet today. So save this. Now we'll run it. Okay. So we get this main window. It has a button. I misspelled window. <laughs> All right, so we click this. Now the second window opens, but check this out. The image didn't load. What's going on here? Well, what actually happened here is pull up our code right here. We're calling this my IMG variable and we're setting it equal to this image. But this is a local variable, right? We need this to be a global variable because for some reason, when you're in a function like this with a second window, Python sees this. Uh, local variable, and it thinks it's garbage, it gets swept up in the Python garbage collection, and it doesn't get displayed. So all we need to do is call global for my image. And now this should work, we save this, run it again, we get this guy, if we click it, boom, sure enough, it opens very cool. And it's just one of those weird things. I'm not even exactly sure why the mechanics of why it does that. You just it, it just does. Notice when we did this earlier, we had all of this stuff outside of this function, it worked just fine, because it's in the root, it's in the main window. So the local variable works in the main window, it just doesn't work in the next one that you open this um, top level window, right? So we can play around with this some more, we can go button two equals button. And we want this to be in top. And let's go text equals close window. How do we do that? Well, we want the command to equal top dot destroy. I think we looked at destroy a few videos ago. That's how you can close things. We just have to make sure and designate that we want to destroy top, not root. So if we save this, come back over here and run it. Oops, drag this over. All right, so open second window. Ah, oh, is that the third time I forgot to pack the button? Uh, all right, dot pack. I'm telling you, it's one of those days here in Vegas, cloudy Vegas today. All right, so now we have open second window. When we do that, we get the second window. It says my second window has the icon, has our image, has this button. If we close it, boom, it closes. We can open it again. There it is again. We can close it. We can open it. <laughs> we can close it and on and on. And there we go. So that's pretty much it. Pretty simple. You know, you don't want to run two versions of this TK function at the same time. Instead, you want to call this top level. It's just what tkinter calls the a second window that you want to open. And pretty straightforward. The only thing to really worry about is this global thing. If you try something inside of here, and it doesn't work, try adding whatever you're trying to do as a global variable that will likely fix it. Um, but uh, yeah, pretty simple.
In this video, I want to show you how to use the file dialog box to open files, no matter what the file is anywhere on your computer. Okay, so you've got your program, you want to open a file, maybe an image, maybe a PDF file, anything at all. How do you do that with Kinter? Well, it's really, really easy. You just use something called the file dialog. And we need to import this. It comes with Kinter, but we need to import it. So from tkinter, import file dialog. Okay. And to use this, we just call root.filename. Now, I should say this won't actually open a file. It'll just return the name of the file and the location of the file. So let's say, you know, we've got these images in our GUI slash images directory. So it'll return C colon GUI colon or slash images slash aspen1.png. Then when you have that location, then you can then open that file in your program programmatically. So we'll look at how to do that. But first things first, let's just look at this dialog box. So we go file dialog and then dot ask open file name, right? And then inside of here, we got to pass a whole bunch of different things. First, we need to tell it what directory to start in. So when the box pops up, what directory do you want to be showing? So you go initial dir and set that equal to whatever you want. So if you just want the C directory, just do that. If we, we uh, for us, we want GUI forward slash images, we do that, right? So then we want title. And now this is just the title of the box that pops up. It'll have a little caption title at the top and you can put anything you want. So let's go select a file. Sounds good. And now we need to tell it which types of files to show. So, you know, you could just put all the files or you could specifically say, just show the PNG files because we want to open a PNG file. You may have PNG files. You might have JPEG images. You might have GIF images, GIF images, however you pronounce that. You might have bitmap images, whatever. You can designate that here. So to do that, we just, we call the, let's see, file types, plural. Try to spell it right. File types, there we go. And then set that equal to whatever you want. And inside of here, we can designate a bunch of different file types if we want um, by putting them in parentheses and then separating them by parent or by a comma, right? So let's see, is that the right number of parentheses? I think so. So uh, let's just start out with we want, I don't know, PNG files. Um, yeah, PNG files. And this first bit is just a little description and that'll pop up in a drop down box and we'll see that in just a second. So then we need to tell it what type of file and PNGs are start with star dot PNG. And the star is basically saying open any files that have a name of any kind star dot PNG, right? So that's it for PNG. If we wanna then designate say for instance, all the files, um, we can go, let's see, again, just type in a little description, all files, and then a comma. And then the type of file this is, this is just wildcard. We want all the files of all the different types. So we would go any name dot any extension, right? Star dot star. And then that closes. And then, okay, I think that's right. I get a little messed up with all the different parentheses, but I think we closed them all. So let's just save this real quick and run it. Uh, I should mention I named this file file.py and I just started out with the basic starter code that we always start out with. You're familiar with that already. So let's head back over here and run this guy. Oops, what did I do? Uh, did I file dialog, I misspelled something. Of course I did. File dialog, there we go, that looks better. Save it run it, pull it over. And when I did, it just automatically popped up this box. And you'll notice we're in C forward slash GUI forward slash images, because that's what we designated. And then we have all of these PNG files. These are the, the images that we did when we made that image viewer several videos ago. So I'm just gonna reuse these. And now you look, see it says PNG files or all files, that comes from this little thing right here, PNG files and all files. And we can type anything at all we want, right? 
let's see if we come back here your code come back actually there we go if we click here for all files it doesn't really change because the only thing we have here are png files right so let's close this real quick and let's change this to oops jpeg and then let's change the description to jpeg files okay so let's save this and run it again and boom it pops up and now there's nothing listed because it's calling the default is the first one you list and it's calling for the jpeg files and there are no jpeg files in this directory so if we click all files boom now they all pop up right so if we click this it closes and nothing happens. So let's take a look real quick and see what, what happens when you click a thing, what it returns. So we could just return this root file name thing in a label. So let's just go, I don't know, my label equals, set it as a label, we want it in root, and we want the text to equal just that. And let's just pack this on the screen real quick. Save this guy, or run it again. And okay, JPEG files, we want all files. Uh, let's call Aspen2. When we do that, here's our main program, it just returns the location, Aspen2, right? So if you actually want to do something with that, if you want to, for instance, open that, then you need to do that separately. But that's okay, because we know the location. And now we can just open that location, we learned how to open images several videos ago when we looked at that image viewer app that we built. So uh, we use pull up our code here, We use this image thing here. So let's go what do we want my underscore image equals image tk dot photo image. Did I spell that right image tk dot photo image. There we go turn blue there. And we want image dot open. And we want what do we want to open we want to open this thing, whatever it is, root file name, right. So now we go my uh, image label, set that equal to a label. And we don't have to put it in root, we could just go image equals um, my image which is this thing. And we want to pack this on the screen real quick. So let's save that, run it, see if this works. And we get JPEG all files, let's open Aspen two. Oh, image TK is not defined. Thought that looked weird. Oh, <laughs> lowercase k. All right, so let's save this. Run it one more time. Pull this over. All right, so we want all files. We want Aspen. And when we do, our main screen pulls up this thing. It's also listed that because we have that on there. And it's it works. So very cool. Now, one thing that you'll notice is whenever I run this thing, it just pops up the file dialog box right away. And that's probably not really practical. Uh, so let's play around with that a little bit. Let's create a button. Let's go my button and set it equal to a button. And we want this in root. And we want the text to equal open file. And we want the command to equal open. Now we need an we need to define an open method here function. And inside of here, I'm just gonna put all this stuff, right? And tab all this over. Okay, so we'll remember when we open an image in a uh, function like this, we need to create a global for its uh, variable. So my underscore image, that should work. And our button we need to dot 
hack this guy. Okay, so let's save this and run it. I almost certainly screwed that up somehow. Let's see how I did it. <laughs> yeah, nope. STR object has no object. Mm-hmm, what do we do? Uh, let's see, my button. Oh, we left it all out. All right, get rid of that, save it. See, I told you I screwed that up. All right, this is getting crazy. Let's clear this screen, run it one more time. All right, that looks good. So we pull this over, we got the button that says open file, we do that, and the little box pops up. We call all files here, let's open Aspen, and boom, it opens. It also puts this on the screen here. We don't necessarily have to have that, um, but that's pretty cool. So very easy, very simple to open any kind of file, and. In this video, we did images because we've already worked with images before, so we're already familiar. But you know, you can do a PDF file, you can do uh, an HTML file, you can do a Python file if you wanted to open it and put its contents on the screen. Whatever you wanna do, you can do with this open dialog, this file dialog thing, and it's pretty simple. The main thing you have to remember is just that it's not opening the file, the file dialog box is just returning the location it's allowing you to click a file and select it, and then it just returns the location. Once you have that location, you can open it in any of the ways that we've already learned how in the past, as far as opening images or, or whatever. You could you know, paste out the contents in a big label if you wanted, whatever you want, uh, you can do, so pretty cool. Okay, so sliders, what am I talking about? You know what a slider is, a little slider that goes down at the bottom or on the side of a program or something like on a web page, or like right here, you know, you slide up and down. How do we do this with Kinter and graphical user interfaces? So that's what we're gonna look at. So I've created a file called slider.py. I have just the basic starter text that we've used pretty much throughout this entire series. And uh, so let's create our first slider. It's very, very simple. We're gonna use the scale widget, which is weird. Why don't they just call it the slider widget? I have no idea, but they've called it uh, scale. So you can designate vertical, up and down, or horizontal, left and right. And the default is up and down for some reason. So we're just going to do that one first. I'm going to call it vertical. And we just create a scale widget. And we do it like we've done all the widgets. We designate we want it in root. And now the only real thing you need to tell it is where to start and where to stop. So you want your slider to go from 0 to 100 from 50 to 1,000, from 250 to 230, whatever you want, whatever range, you have to designate that right here. And we just use a from and to, but the from needs a from and an underscore. And then you set it equal to whatever. Now, if we leave off the underscore, you can see it gets all real angry and it, it realizes that's an error right away. So I have no idea why you need an underscore, but you do. And then you need to designate the two. And notice there's no underscore for the two, which doesn't make sense. I mean, let's be consistent here, people. <laughs> I don't know who built this. So let's, I don't know, let's go what? Uh, 200, I don't know. And now we just go vertical.pack to put this guy on the screen. Now it's important that you pack it on its own line. You don't want to come up here and go dot pack like we have so often in the past. For some reason that screws things up later on and I'll show you why in just a second. Okay, so slider.py, let's save this, head over to our terminal and run it. And when we do that, we get this slider. It goes from zero to 200. It's not much to look at, but you can change the uh, graphical properties of it, change the color, foreground, border, all the stuff. We looked at how to do that for like labels and things. Uh, so you can do that in the same way. Okay, so that's something, I guess, right? Uh, so that's vertical up and down, that's the default. We can also go horizontal, so let's do that real quick. Uh, let's go horizontal, and that's gonna be a scale. Eh, you know what, let's just copy this whole thing. And right here, we just add another attribute, we go orient, we're gonna orient it on the screen, and we want this to be horizontal. If I could spell horizontal, there we go. And likewise, we want to dot pack this guy on the screen. So if we save this, come back over here, run this guy again, zoom, zoom, woo, we get this horizontal widget. All right, 
not that great. One thing I want to show you really quickly, we haven't, I think we looked at this once, I didn't really talk about it, but up here we can designate how big we want our original window to be. We just call root.geometry and then say if we want 400 by 400, we can do that. If we save this, come back here and run it again. You can see now that the whole box is 400 by 400. It's a little bit bigger, gives us some room. Uh, so that's, we'll just show you that real quick. Okay, so we've got these sliders, they slide, they return numbers, but what do we do with them? Well, that's exactly what they're gonna do. They're gonna return a number based on where they're slid to. And we can get that number by calling the dot get method. And we've looked at that for labels, I believe in the past. So we would go horizontal dot get, right? And if we wanted to slap this into a label, we could go, I don't know, my underscore label equals a label. Did I spell that right? L-A-B-E-L, there we go. And we want it in root and we want the text to equal this. And we want to pack this on the screen. So if we save this and run it, we see this zero label right here. Now if we change this, it doesn't change automatically. So if we want to do that, we need to kind of use a function or something. So instead of the label, let's create a button. Let's call it my underscore btn. That wants to be a button in root. And the text is click me. <laughs> and the command equals what slide and we want to pack this so up here let's create this slide function boom and inside of here let's just copy this okay so every time we press the button it'll update this so let's look at that real quick just to make sure this is working zoom pull it over zoop. So let's move this to 103. If we click me, boom, 103. 188, boom, 188. And that's pretty much it. Now, whatever you want to do with that, that is up to you. If you want to say, I don't know, let's say we want to resize this, right? We could do that. It's kind of weird. Uh, let's pull this up because we've got this root geometry right here. We could just bring this over here to our thing here. And instead of say 400, we could just put in, uh, let's see, horizontal.get. But this is an integer and this needs to be a string. So we need to wrap this whole thing in a string function. And that'll allow us to then concatenate that into this. Okay, so that almost works, but we need to change this. We need to tell, we need to send this into our function here. So if we save this and run it, this won't work, I don't think. Let me pull it up and see here. All right, so if we bring this over here, if we click this, oh, it doesn't work. Look at that. So it's changed to 138 horizontally, vertically, it's still 400, right? So if we go 179, yeah, that works. 200, right? Cool, so we can change this to, let's see, 400 if we want. Save this and run it, come back here. All right, we're at 400 by 400. If we change this to 200, boom. We can go back to 400, boom. Right, that's kind of cool. We could do the same thing for this if we wanted to, right? We haven't yet, but we could. Now, what about just moving the slider and having it update based on the slider? We could do that too. That's a little trickier, but let's take a look at that. So instead of using the button, we want to just use the slider. So we'll stick with this horizontal guy. We can send a command into that. And we can send that command equal to, let's say, slide. And then, okay, so that should work. Now, this will not work. This is what I was thinking earlier. We need to pass something from here. We need to pass whatever this is 
into here for some reason. So let's save this and run it just to make sure, but I don't think this is gonna work like I said earlier. Yeah, we get boom, slide is not defined. Oh, that's not the problem I was thinking of. The reason why this isn't working now is because this function is below this. So if we copy this, bring it up here. Okay, so now that error will go away, but it will get a different error, I think, this time. Let's check and see. Yeah, so we get all these errors. So whenever we're, we're sliding this, it's sending the command, but it, it it's not sending what this is, 147. And for some reason, the our slide function won't pick up with the dot get thing. So we need to be explicit when we do that for some reason, just a weird little thing I discovered. Uh, so how do we do that? We just come over to slide and let's just call this, um, uh, boy, I don't know, var, var, variable, I don't know. Save this, I think that's all we really need to do. Well, maybe not, we'll run it and see. Boom. Yeah. See, look what happens. When we're at zero, it's very touchy, right? So if we go 300, it's okay. So as soon as we move it to something, it starts to resize and that resizing makes everything a little wonky. So this is not the best way to do things, right? Unless you wanted to click it and then use your arrow. Oh, you can't even use your arrow. So yeah, that's not a great way to do it. I'd much rather use a button. But if you wanted to do that that way, for some reason, you could by passing in var or value or any just any variable at all, then this whole thing, the slider output, I guess you would call it gets passed into slide function, and that works. So I, I don't really like doing that. But you could now we could let's see, change our button to use both of the sliders. So we could go here, instead of 400, we could concatenate again, call the string function. And inside of here pass, what do we call it vertical dot get. Okay, I think that should work. close our program, close, clear, oops, and there we go, oh, line 18 horizontal dot pack, what has gone wrong, line 18 horizontal dot pack, vertical dot pack, hmm, oh, we're missing a, somehow that got deleted. All right, so this should work now. I'm just playing at this point. This is a, a hot mess, this video, but you know. So let's move this to 118 and 147, boom. Now the whole thing gets <laughs> resized. We could go back to 400 by 118. We could change this to 200. And that works. Right? <laughs> Need to change this to 400, I think, so that we could go back. But yeah, so that's how you do that. So sliders, pretty simple, all things to the contrary. Uh, you know, you can use these for all kinds of different things. They're kind of fun to play with. And like I said, you can change the display of this, make them bigger, make them a different color, uh, change the length of them and all that stuff in the same way we've done with labels and stuff in the past, pretty simple. Okay, so check boxes. We've already looked at radio buttons. Those are those like round buttons that like let you select from different things. Check boxes are square boxes and they're more just like on or off, right? So uh, they're very similar to radio buttons, but there's a couple of little tricky things involved and uh, it's kind of a little bit weird. So we're gonna take a look at that in this video. So I've created a file, I just called it check.py. I'm gonna save it in our GUI directory. And this is just the basic starter code that we've been using forever. So first things first is, we need to create a Kinter variable, just like we did with the radio buttons. And Kinter variables are a little bit different. In order to get their um, value, you don't just call the variable, you call like the variable name dot get. If you wanna set the thing, you usually say the variable name dot set. You know, we've looked at these before. So we're just gonna create one called var. And 
it's we just go var equals and then just declare the kind of variable that you want. So we want this to be whoops int var, right? So you know with kinter variables you could have integer variables or you could have uh, for instance string variables, but in this case we want int. We're going to actually change this in a minute, but the reason why we want int is because when you check box, when you check a box, the value that you're assigning to it behind the scenes is either a zero or a one. And one, I think, means you've checked it, and zero means you haven't checked it. So those are one and zero are numbers, they're integers, so we use int var here. So to actually build a checkbox, I'm just going to call it C for checkbox. We just go check box, uh, button spell. And the same thing as always, we want to put it in root and, you know, put the text as anything you want to uh, check this box, I dare you. <laughs> right? Now, we need to assign the value of the variable name that we're going to use for this. And we're going to use our var variable. So we just type in variable equals and then set that equal to var. Now there's a couple other things you can put on here. And we'll take a look at those in just a second. But just for right now, uh, let's go C dot pack, pack this guy on the screen. Now, I mean, we can save this and run it. So let's go Python check dot pi, pull this over. And you know, we can check this and yeah, it does stuff, but it's not actually doing anything, right? So to actually see what's going on behind the scenes, let's just create a little variable real quick here. And what do we call it? my or label did I say variable label we want a label and we we'll set that equal to label and then what root and the text we want set equal to var dot get we want to get what's in that variable and then we could just pack it on the screen and I think that will work okay so we save this and come back here and run it this is not a great solution but we can see right away it's unchecked and it's zero. If we check this, it won't update. We need to actually create some sort of function in order to do that. So let's go ahead and do that real quick just to see. Let's pull this back up. And what? Let's just create a button. My button equals a button and go root and the text equals show selection, I guess. All <laughs> right. And then what we want this to have a command equals to show. And let's just come up here real quick and create a show function. And we could just change this to this. All right, so when we click this button, it'll run this function, and it'll show this and update it. So I think that will work, we need to pack this guy on the screen. I always forget that. All right, so let's run this and see. So check this box, I dare you, show selection, zero. If we check the box, one, 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 zero, 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 zero. Okay, so that works and that's how you do that. So that's basically the functionality of the checkbox. Now we can get into some other weird little things and we will just now because why not? We're having fun here. Uh, but uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we're using this int var, we can change this to string var. And if we do, we can, the default is zero or one, but we can change that if we want, we can have the output be anything we want, we can change it to pizza if you check the box, right, it doesn't have to be one. If you don't check the box, it could be, you know, john, like, whatever you want, you can assign. And you do that down here when you create your check box, or check button, whatever you want to call it, just by defining the on value. And then let's just call it on or the off value equals off, right? So if we check the box now, instead of it being one, it'll be on. If we don't check the box now, instead of it being zero, it'll be off. Now on its face, this seems pretty simple, but we can't run into some problems. And let's just see by running this. So if we save this, Remember, we've up here, we've changed this now to a string variable. Why? Because this is no longer zero or one, it's on or off. 
and the words on and off are strings, so we need to change our variable to a string variable. So let's go ahead and run this and see, and we're gonna get some problems here. First thing right off the bat, you'll notice the box is checked by default, and before it wasn't checked by default. I'm not sure why that is. But if, now if we click this, nothing happens, right? That's weird. Now, but if we uncheck it and then click it, now it says off. If we check it again, now it says on. So what in the world is, is going on here? Well, I don't know. This is a little glitch I've discovered. I did a little research. I couldn't figure out what, what in the world's going on here. It's obviously printing something on the screen because there's space here, right? But I have no idea why. And also this is, un, this is checked by default and we don't really want that. So the way that I find as a workaround is to right up here at the top, when you first define this thing, before you even pack it onto the screen, we can use something called the deselect function. And it's just deselect, right? And that does exactly what it sounds like. It deselects it by default. So if we save this and run it, pull this over, the first thing you notice that it's not selected by default, which is good. Now, if we click this, it says off right away. So that works now. If we uncheck it and click it, it says on right away. There's no big space in here, so nothing weird is going on. And that works. So now we can test it again, run it one more time, and this time start off the bat by checking it, and that works. So um, I have no idea why that is, but it just is. It's one of those weird little kinter things that you just gotta sort of remember. So on, off, that's pretty cool. Like I said earlier, we could totally mess around with this and call the on value pizza and the off value hamburger. I, I don't know, <laughs> like, right? Let's run this again. Check this box, I dare you. Pizza, <laughs> hamburger, you know, like, why in the world would you wanna do that? Well, you know, come back over here and let's go uh, super size. And then here, let's go regular size. All right, so and then here for our string, where we define it, check this box, I dare you. You could say, would you like to super size your order, right? Check here. I don't know, <laughs> right? So if you got an, an app where you're ordering food online and you'd like to supersize your order, you could check this and boom, now it's, you know, it's supersized, something like that. So those are check boxes, an awful lot like radio buttons, but you know, with some little bit of differences, specifically this deselect thing and that weirdness around that. I have no idea why that's the case, but it is. And uh, it's a pretty simple workaround, so. All right, drop down boxes. What am I talking about? Well, think of like a web form where you click the little drop down box, box opens, there's a menu you can select from, you pick the thing and that's that. Well, basically the same thing, but with Kinter. So a drop down box is basically something called an options menu, an option menu, singular. So to do that, let's go create a variable. And this acts an awful lot like the check boxes we looked at in the last video. So there's a lot of things that are similar. So you'll notice that. So it's just option, uh, we need to set this equal to option menu. And we want this in root. And just like with the check boxes, we need to assign a variable to this so that, you know, whatever we check in the boxes, whichever box we select, whichever item in the box we select, that will be assigned to a variable. And we could call it var if we want, or we can call it clicked, whatever you want. And that's that. So now inside of here, the next thing is to sort of designate the items in the menu. So we could go Monday, Tuesday, and you just separate these with commas, Thursday, and the most important day, Friday, right? So now we just drop dot pack onto the screen. Now we've created this clicked variable. We need to actually define this because just like with the check boxes, this is a Kinter variable. So it's a little different. You set it and get it and you define whether it's a string variable or an integer variable. In this case, our menu items are strings, so we're gonna use a string variable. So we just call clicked equals string var, and that's it. 
All right, so this will work. And I should mention, I just used the same starter code we've been using, and I'm saving this as dropdown.py. So this will work, but it won't show a default value as you'll see here. Let's just run this and see. So right off the bat, pull this over. You can see here's our menu, but there's no default items. But if you click on it and then select an item, it'll update, but that's not great. We need a, an actual default item. So how do we do that? Well, it's pretty simple. You know, we've played with these uh, variables, these Kinter variables before, and we can get and set. So in this case, we want to set, and then we just pick which one we want to set. So let's just call Monday here. So if we save this, come back here and run it. Now, pull this over, boom, it says Monday right at the beginning. Very cool, right? So, okay, so how, how do we get the selection and use it to do stuff with? Well, just like the checkboxes in the last video, we can just access this clicked variable. So let's create a button, my button, and that's a button and it's in root. And we want the text to say, show selection. And let's give this a command equals show, just like we did in the last video. And then up here at the top, we can define show. And then let's go my label equals label. And we want this in root and we want the text equal. Now we're going to want this clicked, not in quotation marks, clicked dot get. Right. And then we want to pack this on the screen. Down here, our button, we need to pack that one too. I don't always forget that. Okay, so if we save this, this should work, I think. Okay, so show selection, boom, Monday, uh, Thursday, boom, boom, boom. Friday, bump. Okay, so that's how you do that. Now, once you've done that, obviously you can do anything you want with it, right? One little thing I do want to show you. Look down here. Here we're sort of designating what options we want to show up in the menu, what items we want to show up in the menu, and that's okay. It works, but like you might have a hundred things in your your drop down that you want, and this is already starting to get unruly. So instead of doing it like this, we can actually just use a um, Python list. So let's create a list. Let's call it options. And it's just a, a regular Python list, right? And I'm just going to print in and paste in these items. So here, you know, I'm going to put these one on each line because that's what we like to do with lists. Makes it easier to read. So here we can, instead of putting all of these guys in here, we can just pass in this list options. Now, one thing we have to do that's a little different, not really intuitive, we need to put a star in front of it. So, all right, here, this looks good. Now here, when we set this, we set it equal to Monday. We could now, if we wanted to get really fancy, set this equal to options and then just pick an item, right? We want the zeroth item in our list. It's just a Python list, so the zeroth item is Monday. So we'll just pass it in like that. It's a little, little nicer way to do that. So sort of eyeball on this, everything looks good. So if we save this, come back here and run it again. It works the same exact way, right? It's just now it's been created as a list. Why would you want to do this? Well, it's just easier. So like later on, if we wanted to add Saturday, right? Boom, we just do it like that. It's easy. You just go right to the list. It's easier to read. It's easier to edit in the future. And then everything just works. So if we save this and run it just to make sure, we get boom, Saturday is there, Saturday. So pretty simple, pretty straightforward. This is very similar, like I said, to the checkboxes. We're using the same Kinter variables in the same sort of way, and we're showing them in the same sort of way with the show function that we created and the click dot get. Uh, this is a little different because this time we're also setting it to begin with. So that's kind of fun. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Okay, databases. Up until now, we've been having some fun with Kinter, but adding a database to any type of program vastly improves the sort of power of that program. You can do a lot of stuff with databases where you just can't do without. So, you know, likely whatever you build ever, you're going to need a database. 
So we're gonna start looking at how to use a database with Kinter. So we're gonna use the SQLite 3 database, which comes with Python. So it's super easy to use. Most people don't even realize it comes with Python and it's not very powerful. It's not like MySQL or Postgres, but it's great for small projects, test projects, hobby projects, things like that. And if you learn how to use it, it's really easy to learn how to use MySQL and Postgres after that. So it'll be easy to sort of switch over if you need something more powerful. So to use, SQLite with our Kinter program, all we have to do is import it. And it's almost ridiculous how easy it is to, to, uh, to import this. All we have to do is type in import SQLite 3 and boom, we now have SQLite database in our program. Very cool. All we have to do now is connect to it and start using it. So I've created a new file called database.py. have the same basic starter code that we've been using forever. So the first thing we need to do is create a database or connect to one that already exists. And the commands for both are the same. So let's go create a database or connect to one. And to do that, we create a connection to the database. And so we just create a variable, call it anything you want, but I'm going to call it con short for connection. And we're going to set it equal to SQLite three dot connect. And then inside of here, we just pass in the name, of the database we wanna to connect to or create. So I think in the next few videos, we're gonna create a, a basic sort of address book app, right? So let's create a database called address underscore book dot DB. So this doesn't exi exist yet, right? We haven't created it yet, oops. But like I said, if it doesn't already exist, this command will create it for us and it'll actually save it in whatever directory we're currently in. So we've been saving all of our code in these videos in the GUI directory. So it'll save address underscore book dot DB in the GUI directory. Super easy, super cool. So the next thing we need to do is create a cursor. And a cursor is sort of like the little thing you send off to do stuff with the database. So anytime we wanna execute any sort of command, the cursor does that. We send it off and it does it comes back with the result, that's the cursor. And same thing, we just create a variable, I'm gonna call it C for cursor. You tend to type it a lot, so I don't wanna type out cursor every time, so I just call it C. Easy to type for all of you lazy people that are just as lazy as me. So cursor, okay, so this is a cursor instance, I guess. And so let's go create cursor, okay. And anytime we make a change to our database, we want to commit those changes to the database. That's just a common database thing. So to do that, we just go con dot commit. So let's go commit changes. And then finally, whenever we're done, we always want to close our connection. And we don't really have to. Uh, whenever the program ends, our connection closes automatically. But it's sort of just the polite thing to do to explicitly close your database connection. So we just go con.close and that is that. Okay, so we've got our cursor, we've got our database created. Now we need a table. If you know anything about databases, you know a database isn't really anything. It's the tables inside that do all the work, hold all the data. And it's the table that we're always interacting with. And think of a table as a spreadsheet, it has columns and rows. And we just need to designate what those columns are. And then every time we add an entry, that becomes a new row, right? So think like first name, last name, address, zip code. Those are all columns in the database table. So we need to create that table and designate those columns. And so uh, that's what we're gonna do now. Let's go create table. Okay, so to do that, we use our cursor. We always use our cursor. And usually when we do stuff to the database, we're executing some sort of command. So we always, almost always wanna go execute here. And then inside of here, we need to, you know, do some SQL, structured query language, SQL commands to do whatever we wanna do. And in this case, we wanna create a table. Now, usually you just put quotation marks and then you type in your commands. But since we're creating a table, tables are kind of big, there's gonna be a lot of stuff for us to type here. I'm gonna use these doc type string things and it's just six quotation marks and it's an open and a close uh, quotation marks and like i said this allows us to do stuff on multiple lines otherwise you could use single quotes and do it all on one line so what we want to do is create a table right 
and now we need to name it. So let's call our table addresses, right? And now inside of these parentheses, we need to just designate the different columns that we want. So uh, let's go, we want a first name. And now we need to designate the data type. And so this is going to be text. Now, the cool thing about SQLite is it only has five data types. And those are text, which is just text, integers, which are whole numbers, 10, 15, 108, uh, real, which are decimal numbers, 1995, 2795, that sort of thing, uh, null, which means does it exist or does it not exist, and blob. And blobs are like image files, video files, things like that. So pretty simple. Databases usually have a lot more data types, and it's always kind of complicated, but you only ever use a few, right? Text and numbers, basically. So that's one of the cool things about SQLite. So we, we have first name, we want last underscore name as well. And that'll be text. Uh, we want the address, and that's text. And you'll notice I'm separating each one with a comma. And uh, that's pretty simple. Address, uh, let's go city, that's a text. Let's go state, that's text. And let's go zip code. And that's going to be an integer. Okay, so it's the last one, we don't have to put a comma at the end of that. I just sort of do this to make this look good. And boom, there we go. Now we could have used single quotes and put all of those on one long line, but it's really hard to read. This is much easier to read. So that's why we use those triple quotation marks. Okay, so I misspelled execute it looks like execute. Man, that was hard. Execute. There we go. Okay, so we only need to run this once we need to create our table one time, we need to commit those changes, close our connection. So I'm just going to save this head over to our terminal here. And we want Python database.py. If we run it, this box pops up, there's nothing in here, because we haven't done anything yet. So we can just go ahead and close it. And now if I pull up a little thing here and go into my C drive and look at GUI, you see now this address book.db database file exists. It created it for us. Inside of it, presumably, it has the table that we just created as well. We won't really know till the next video when we start putting data in and see whether or not it worked uh, to find out if it did work. But I think it worked. That's pretty simple uh, code right there. So in the next video, we'll start to build out our Kinter app with fields and stuff so we can type in people and their addresses to add to the database. And that should be cool. I should mention very quickly on my website, I've got an entire course on SQLite with Python. So if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of this, check that out. It's $29 for the course. But of course, if you sign up for total membership using that coupon code YouTube, you get all of my courses for just $27, in which case you'll get this one for free. And it has, it's an hour and a half long, 22 videos, and it has all the stuff in, in much greater detail. We're not going to go into great detail in these videos right here. I'm just going to show you some basic stuff and you can learn more later if you want, but uh, definitely worth checking out if you're interested in all this database stuff. In this video, we want to start to build out the graphical user interface, the things that allow us to type in entries and save them into the database and all that good stuff. We got our database.py file from the last video. We've connected to our database, created the database. We have our cursor, we've created our table. Now we can comment out the table because we don't want to recreate the table every time we run the program. We just need to do it one time. So now we can add stuff to the table and that's what we want to look at in this video. So the first thing we want to do is create some text boxes that we can type information into. So we want one for first name, last name, address, city, state, and zip code. And we're going to use entry boxes, entry widgets with tkinter. Kinter. Uh, we've done this in previous videos, so you should remember how to do it. If not, Take a look back at the older videos. So I'm going to create one called first name and let's call it's an entry widget and we want it in root and we want the width to be what say 30 ish. It's probably good. And we need to now put this on the screen. So F underscore name dot grid. And we don't want to pack this because we're going to have a whole bunch of stuff here. So we don't want to really just pack everything. We want to have a little bit more sort of options to place them exactly where we want. So of course, we're going to use the grid system. So we want this to be in row equals zero and column equals zero. And for this one, well, first, let me just copy this. And then for the first one here, I'm also going to put, excuse me, a pad x of say 20, just to pad it a little bit. 
So now we need one for last name, address, city, state, and zip. So I'm just going to copy and paste. So last name, address, city, state, zip. And then just come through here and change these to L name. This one will change to address and address. This is very glamorous work here. <laughs> city, city, and state, and state. And finally, zip code and zip code. Okay, so we probably want them in column one because we need to put text next to them, a little label to describe which you know box is which. So we should probably change this to one for each of these. Now that I think about it, it's a good thing to think these things through first. I should have really done that. <laughs> All right, so the first one is in row zero. The next one we want on the next line down. So that's row one, row two, row three, row four, row five, and that looks like it. So, all right, we can put these all back together here. And let's make a little comment. Let's say create text boxes. All right, so like I said, we also want to create uh, text box labels. And let's see, let's just go, let's call them first name underscore label. And that's of course gonna be a label and we want it in root and we want the text to equal first name and that should work. Now we want a first underscore name underscore label dot grid. And we want this to be row equals zero and column equals zero. Okay, so same deal. We just need one now for last name, address, city, state, zip. And just come through here and change these again. So address label, and address label, city label, city label, state label. Very exciting. State label. A zip code label and zip code label. And again, we want row one, two, three, four, and five. And up here, we just need to change these to last. And then again, address, bear with me, city ways of Kinter state. And finally, zip code. All right. So let's put these all together. I just put line spaces just so it's a little easier to make sense of it as we're typing them. Okay, so now we also need buttons, right? So let's create, we want to uh, create a submit button. Right? Okay. So let's call this submit underscore button. And that's going to be a button. And it's going to be in root and the text is going to be what? Add record to database. All right, that works. And we want this to have a command and let's just call this what submit. Probably good. All right, so we want submit button dot grid. And where do we want this? We want this in row equals six because we want it under, underneath there. And column equals probably zero, right? And we probably want this to span across both columns. So let's go column span equals two. And what else do we want? I probably want to put some padding. So pad y equals 10, let's say. And that'll put it down a little. And I want pad X to equal probably another 10. That'll put it over a little bit. And I want iPad X to equal 100. So we want to stretch it out a little bit. Okay, so I think that will work. Now we need to create this submit function. So let's kind of head up here somewhere up here. This looks good. And let's go create submit function database, I guess. So define submit. And let's just return it for now. Eh, 
Actually, let's clear the text boxes. So every time we enter stuff into the text boxes and click the button to submit it into the database, we want those text boxes then to clear. So then we can afterwards type in another record if we want. We don't want that information to just be sitting there. So we can do that with F underscore name, call the actual name of the entry widget, dot delete, and then give it a zero and an end. So we just do this for each one. First name, last name, address, city, state, zip. And one more time. <laughs> fun work of typing these in over and over. So address, um, city, state, and finally zip code. All right, so let's save this and run it. Pull up our thing here and we want database.py. Pull it over and yeah, it's looking pretty good. So now if we type some stuff in here and then click this button, boom. It disappears. All right, so far so good. Not bad. So now what do we want to do? We need to actually create some code to submit the stuff that we type into the database itself. So the first thing that's kind of weird is you got to connect to your database and create a cursor inside of your function when you use function. I'm not really sure why that is, but it is the case. So Make sure these are tabbed over. And let's head down to the bottom here and grab these two lines. We want to commit our stuff and close our connection. We need to do that inside of our function as well. Tab those over. Okay, so now how do we actually submit the stuff from our form, right? Okay, so let's go insert into a table, right? And just like before, when we had our C dot execute to add to create a table, we're going to again, C dot execute. And we almost always execute our cursor. It's just what we do. So we're going to use SQL now to insert into and we name the table that we want addresses, right? And the values of something, right? So before we use this doc type string thing, doc string, doc type, whatever it's called. Uh, this time I want to use placeholder variables, just a different way to do it. And you do that by just creating sort of dummy variables. And you start with a colon. Each one starts with a colon. So I'm going to name these the same as our text boxes. You can name them anything you want, but it makes sense to name them what they're going to be. So first name, underscore last name. Oops, we need a colon. Separate them each with commas and then colon address, comma, colon, city, not a period, a, col a comma, colon, state, comma, colon, zip code. Okay. Now, at the end of this, we need to, oops, there we go, stick a comma and then come down. Now inside of here, we need to create a, a, I almost said Ruby dictionary, a Python dictionary. And it's just this. And Python dictionaries have key value pairs. And the key will be this dummy variable. And the value will be whatever's in our text box, right? So that's how that works. Pretty simple. So let's go F underscore name. And you separate them with colons. And then remember, Kinter variables, we can get them and set them. Well, entry widgets are like Kinter variables. We can get or set them. So that's what we're going to do. So let's go F underscore name dot get and then comma. And then just on the next line, we just go through and do one for each of these last name colon L underscore name dot get Some very exciting work here. <laughs> Address colon address dot get and then what city colon city dot get and then state colon state dot get and then finally zip code colon zip code dot get and this is the last one so we don't have to put a comma and remember, 
these things are these. So if you named these up here, A, B, C, D, E, F, this column here would be A, B, C, D, E, F. We just happen to name them the same as we named our widgets, our entry widgets, just because that kind of makes sense. Okay, so now we can kind of do some stuff here to make this look better. Okay, so if we save this and we can run this just to make sure it worked. Now we're not gonna be able to see if it worked yet because we haven't created any functionality to output the stuff from the database onto the screen, but at least we could see if we get an error. So let's go John Elder, uh, 10 West Elm. I used to live on 10 West Elm in Chicago years and years ago. I live in Vegas now, but I used to live in very cold Chicago downtown. It was pretty cool. So add record, boom, it disappeared. And if we end it, we didn't get any errors up here. So we can assume that it added the thing in and we're good to go. Okay, so now we need to create a button to actually pull whatever's in the database out and then put it on the screen. So we can see whether or not this first part worked yet. So let's go down here and let's just create a, a query button. And we wanna call this what? Query underscore button. And this is a button. We want it in root and we want the text to equal what? Show records maybe? I think that's probably good. And we want to give this a command of what? Let's call this query create a query function. And we want to query underscore button dot grid this thing. And so we're in row, what, seven now? Column equals zero. And again, we want to column span this guy to two. And let's go pad y equals 10 and pad x equals 10. And let's stretch this with iPad x equals 137, which I happen to know is, is a very nice size. So if we save this real quick and just look at this, we can see, oh, name query is not defined. We gotta create that function real quick. So what do we call it, query? Let's head up here and let's say underneath our submit guy, submit function, let's go create query function. And let's go define query, do you E R Y. And let's just return for now. All right, save this. Cancel that. Run this again. Boom. Now what did I? Oh, I misspelled column span. I do that sometimes. Uh column span duh. That's a ugly typo. All right, so save this. Run it again. Third time's the charm. And boom. So that button looks pretty good size compared to the other one. And of course it doesn't do anything yet, so we can close this, let's clear the screen. Okay, so querying the database, we haven't really talked about this yet, but it's, it's fairly simple. Again, let's come up to our submit guy and let's copy, we, we still need to connect to the database again. And we still need to commit and close. So Grab that, there we go. Okay, so to query the database, uh, it's pretty simple. We just, again, use our cursor and execute like always. So it's that C dot execute and it's a function. So inside of here, we wanna run some SQL, SQL command, we wanna execute our SQL command. And the command we want is select. So we wanna select, and what do we wanna select? We wanna select everything. So the star means everything. And we wanna select it from our addresses table, right? So one more thing we wanna do is, in most databases, you have to designate and create a primary key for each record. And a primary key is a unique record, a unique number. So, uh, you know, every single entry you make, it's a unique sort of ID number. And in SQLite 3, it creates it for you. So we don't even need to do that ourselves, which is really, really cool, but it kind of ignores it. Since it creates it for you, it ignores it, unless you specifically tell it to print that number. And we kind of want to see what that number is. So we want to select everything and 
the OID. And OID, I'm not sure what that stands for. I don't even remember at this point. Original ID, maybe. I don't know. But it's the primary key, right? So primary keys are useful for a lot of different things. Specifically, later on, if you want to delete a record, you don't want to delete John Elder because there might be 20 records of somebody named John Elder. But each record has a unique ID. So you could delete record number 87, for instance. And there are no other records that have the ID of 87. So that's what that's used for. So, okay, so we can we create this, this uh, command here. We want to select everything and our IDs from addresses. We also need to then do something called fetch all. So C fetch all. And fetch all does just what it sounds like. It fetches all of the records. Now you can do fetch one and it will just bring back one record, the first record. Uh, you can do fetch many and then in here say designate how many records you want to fetch. 50 for instance. Um, we don't want to do that. We just want to fetch all. Okay, so normally you could just print out C, well, just print out this thing, right? But this is Kinter and print doesn't really work with Kinter. So we need to create a label and kind of print that onto the screen. But first, let's just run this by actually doing that. Well, actually, instead of using c.fetchall, let's smush that into a variable so that we can then put that variable into a label as we've done so many times. So let's call this records and set that equal to that. Now we can pet print out records and it won't print it to the screen in our app, but it will print it to the terminal after we close the app. So let's run this real quick just to see what this record looks like that we've already put in. Head back over, run it again. And if we click show records, nothing happens. But then if we then close it, we see boom, this record appears. And you'll notice these brackets, that means that, means that this is returning a Python list. And inside of that list, there is a Python tuple. And then inside of the tuple, you can access each of these things by their index number. So John is the zeroth item in the list. In the tuple, one, two, three, four, five, and then six. So that's the way it's returned. We can, of course, do anything we want with this information, this data. We can sort it out and, and put it on the screen however we want. So what exactly do we want to do? Well, instead, of, we'll leave the print there for now in case we need to troubleshoot. But since we just have one record, let's go, let's create a, a for loop, right? So let's go for, what do we want to call this? So we've called this one records. So let's call this for record in records, right? And then we want to, let's create a variable called print records. And we want that to plus equal out whatever is in records. And since, since it's a list with a tuple inside of it, the zeroth item of the list is our tuple. So we can actually call the zeroth item. We'll change this in a minute and you'll see why. But for the very first time we do this, since there's only one record, we can do it like this. Now I want to sort of print out record right, which is the item in the loop that we're going to loop through. And we also want to concatenate and then put a line break. And the reason why we want to do this is because we're going to create a label here. And we want each item that gets printed out to be on its own line. So we have to put a, a line break in here. Now, this is a problem because record the thing we're printing out, you can see one of these a couple of these things are integers. And you can't concatenate a string with an integer. So we actually need to convert this whole thing to a string, which is not too hard. We can just wrap this whole thing in the string function. Okay, so now outside of this loop, we want to create a label. So let's call this the query label. So we're making a query and set that equal to label. And then it's in root and the text we want to be print underscore records, right? Now, we actually need to, before we start looping, we need to create that variable and set it equal to nothing since we're in a function here. And uh, that's how that works. So let's go 
loop through results. So finally, we need to query underscore label dot grid this thing out. And I think we're in row eight now. Come down here and look. Yeah, so row seven is the last thing we did. So now we're in row eight. And we want column equals zero. And we need to column span this thing out to equal two. And I think that will work. So if we save this and run it again, pull this over, click show records, boom, on each line, we get an item in that tuple, John Elder, and we could do whatever we want with these things. Okay, so that works with one record, but we're gonna have more than one record. So let's create another one real quick. Let's go Bob Smith. He lives at 20 East Cedar, Cedar Street, I don't know, St. Louis, Mo, Missouri. I don't know what the zip code is there, 62901, I don't know, who knows. Okay, so now we add this to the record, boom, it disappears. If we click here, nothing happens, why? Well, let's close this and we can see, whoops, it looks like this has been added twice. What's going on there? Oh, that's from the first time we clicked the button. Disregard that. <laughs> okay, so look, when we call this loop, we're calling the zeroth item in our list, which if we pull this back up, here's our list and there are two items in it. Item one is this tuple and then there's a comma, and then here's item two. So we're calling item one, or item zero, which is this item, zero with item. So that's the only thing it prints to the screen. We don't really wanna do that. So let's just take this off and just print out everything, right? So if we save this and run it, let's clear the screen, run it again, pull this over, show records, boom. Now we get each tuple printed on its own line and it has, you know, everything inside of there that's in our records. So then we see the last thing is the ID, the primary key, the OID. So there's one, there's two, very cool. So now this is tuples. We know from just regular Python how to do stuff with tuples. So we can format this any way we want. And it's still printing this out on the screen. So I think now we can get rid of this print thing right here. I'll just comment it out in case you want to reference this code later. But down here, let's see, in our for loop, we can tell this to print out anything we want. So each record is an item now, is a tuple, and inside of that it has item numbers, tuple numbers, right? So the zeroth item of each of these records is the first name. So if we just do that and save this and run it, now we will get first names printed, John and Bob, right? Very cool. So you know, we can do anything we want with this. We can concatenate some more. Let's put in a space and then concatenate again. And then let's just grab this whole thing and paste it and then concatenate the line break again. This guy needs a quotation mark. Okay, instead of record, the zeroth item, let's call the first item, which is this, the last name. Excuse me, save this, run it again, pull it over, show records, John Elder, Bob Smith. Very, very cool. If we add another person, uh, Tina uh, Miller, I don't know, she lives at 89 Apple Street in, I don't know, what's a good town? New York, New York, 10092. I have no idea what the zip code is there. Now if we add this, boom, that disappears. If we click this button again, boom, Tina Miller pops right on up. So like I said, you could format this any way you want. I'm gonna leave that to you. I'm just showing you the basic functionality of how to do these things. There's a thousand ways you can create reports and things and uh, output data however you want. That's the beauty of Python and Kinter. So I'll leave that to you. I think in the next video, we need to build a thing in here to delete a record. If we wanna remove Bob Smith, there's no way to do that yet. So uh, we'll do that in the next video. In the meantime, if you're interested in this database stuff, specifically the SQLite database, head over to my website, codemy.com. I just released a course not long ago 
and SQLite. This is just pure SQLite in Python. And it's 22 videos, hour and a half long, and it costs $29. Of course, you can sign up for total membership using that YouTube coupon code I'm always going on about. And you'll pay just $27 for all of my courses, including this one, which is better than one course for 29. So if you're interested, definitely use that coupon code. Some people don't, I don't understand it. Uh, and you'll learn all of this stuff in great detail. We really go in in more detail than I'm gonna go into in this series. I'm just gonna show you some basic stuff right now. Like I said, if you're interested, take a look at that course to learn you know, in-depth stuff about SQLite. In this video, we're gonna take a look at how to delete a record from our database. So let's just run this real quick and show you what we have so far. So here's our database. We can add things in here. Click the add button, it adds it. We can show them. And we have John Elder, Bob Smith, Tina Miller. We can you know, configure this to output any of this stuff that we want, but just to make it easier, we've just put the first and last name. Uh, I think right now, let's go ahead and add the user ID number, that OID number that we talked about earlier, because uh, we're gonna need that in a minute to delete records and I'll go into why that is. So let's pull our code back up and go to the, let's see, query section here. And down here where we're outputting the results on the screen, we have first name, which is this record, at the zeroth item of the, the uh, list, I guess, the tuple. And then the first item is the last name. I believe the, the OID is the sixth or the fifth. So let's just go ahead and continue concatenating and let's add another space and then concatenate again. And here we just want to copy all of this and between these just paste this in. And I'm not sure if it's the fifth or the sixth. Let's try the sixth and see. So let's save this, run it again real quick. Pull this over, show records. Okay, that was right. So now we're getting this number next to these and uh, that's cool, that works. Uh, let's see, we can get a little crazy if we want. And this might not work, but let's add another plus. And then inside of here, we can put a backspace, a backslash T, that stands for tab, if we wanna tab that over a little bit. So let's save that and give it a look. Now uh, this may or may not work. It'll definitely work, but yeah, okay. Cause sometimes if these don't line up correctly, the tabs go over a little bit too much or not enough. So, okay, so we now we have the first names, the last names and the ID. At the top of here, we could put a little, you know, a thing that said first name, last name, or a, a little field that says name, and then a little field that says ID number or something. We'll just leave it like this for now. Um, let's see, I'm seeing this right up here. This is bothering me. It's shoved right up to the top. Let's push this down a little bit. We can add some padding to this. So we just wanna do this first name in this text box here. So real quick, I'm just gonna scroll down to the text box section. So here we have, uh, here we go, text boxes. So first name, so here I'm just gonna add a pad Y and set that equal to, now we haven't done this before, you can add a tuple here if you only wanna add padding to one side. So I just want padding on the top. So that's, I'm gonna add 10 to the top and then I can go comma zero and I wanna put no padding below. So we'll do that. And we could just copy this whole thing come down here to the label. I wanna do the same thing to the label. That's right there. Oops. There we go. So let's save this and run it just to see what we have here. Just playing around at this point because it's fun. Okay, that looks a little better. It's pushed down a little bit and these still all line up. So, okay, now we wanna talk about how to uh, delete records. So if we click the show records, we have these records, right? John Elder, Bob Smith and Tina Miller, and we wanna delete them. Now there's a couple of ways to delete things. You can say, you can look for a specific record and then say, delete this record. But what we search for is important. So if we said search for John Elder and delete that record, that will work. But there may be four or five John Elders in our database, common name, right? John's a common name, Elder's fairly common. You know, Bob Smith, there may be 50 Bob Smiths in your database. So if you say delete Bob Smith, that command will go through and delete every single Bob Smith in your database. And you probably don't want that. So we need to search by this OID, this primary key number, this user number to uh, delete things because each record in our database only has one 
specific unique ID number. So if we say, you know, get rid of Tina Miller, she's number three. If we say delete number three, we'll just lose Tina Miller, which is what we want. So how do we actually go about deleting things from a, a SQLite database? Well, it's pretty simple. And we can come up here and let's just come somewhere up here to the top of our thing. And let's go create function to delete a record. All right, so let's define our function and let's call it what? Delete, probably good. Now inside of here, we wanna do all the same things that we've done in the past, which is connect to our database and create a cursor. We could do that and then commit our changes and close. So we can just paste these in here. Now inside of here, let's go uh, delete a record. So how do we do this? Well, it's pretty simple. It's just like everything we've done. We use our cursor and we execute a command as we've always done. And the command that we want is delete from and then name the table that we want to delete from. And if you remember, our table is addresses, right? And then now we want to use something called the where clause. And this is just a SQL clause. So delete from addresses where, and here you designate the column that you want to search in. So we want the OID column where the OID equals, and then what? What do we want? Well, let's put placeholder here for now. All right. Now I'm seeing this does not look right. So we need to wrap all of this in quotation marks. Okay. So that's right. Delete from your database table addresses where OID equals placeholder. Now we could do the same thing. We could go where F underscore name equals and then put quotes. Well, we need single quotes. John, right? We could do that, but like I said, that'll give us the problem where it'll go through and delete every single John in our database. So we don't want that. Of course, what we want is OID equals place holder. Now we'll create, we'll, we'll change that placeholder in just a bit. So what we need now is in our app, we need a, a box where we can type in the number of the ID number that we want to delete and we need a button to actually delete. So let's go do that real quick. And let's just come down here, create text boxes. Underneath here, let's go create, well, let's see, we have some more down here. Yeah, let's just go down right here and let's go create a delete button. And let's just copy all of this and paste it in. But instead of query button, let's call it delete button. Same thing here, delete button. And this is not row seven, this is what we're on. There was a row eight here. So I think we're on row nine, maybe. Let's try that, we're in row nine, column span is two, pad x to pad y. I have no idea what this is gonna be, but the command we want here is delete, right? Cause that's the uh, function we created all the way up here just now, this delete function, right? Okay. So let's change this to delete record. All right, so let's save this and just run it real quick to see if the formatting is correct. It's probably not. Okay, so this button's a little bit bigger. So I'll probably knock off what? Let's go 135 on the iPad. X. So save this, run it again. This is just for show, basically. Okay, that's pretty close. Eh. Let's add back one more. So 136. Save that. Run it. Okay, that's pretty, pretty good. Now we need probably what above this, we need a little label and a box that says, you know, ID number or whatever. So, okay, let's do that. So I'm gonna add these, I think right here. 
So let's go delete. Well, let's start with the box itself right here. Let's go delete underscore box. I don't know, name it whatever you want. And it's an entry box and it's in root and the width equals 30 like all the rest. And then we can go delete underscore box dot grid. And we want this in row, let's go row equals nine, column equals one. Okay, I think that will do. Yep, and then for a label for the same guy, let's go delete underscore box underscore label equals label. And that's in root. And the text equals ID number, I guess. Or we can do it out like that, ID number. Yeah, that'll work. And again, we want to now grid this onto the screen. So delete underscore box label dot grid equals row equals 10 column. I could type column equals one, no, zero, right? So now we have to, let's put this back up here. Now we also have to change, since we put these two rows above, we need to change our button to row 11. Okay, I think that'll work. Let's save this and run it just to make sure everything looks okay. And it does not, everything's all sort of messed up. Oh, we need it to be the same row, obviously, doy. <laughs> all right, so this should be row nine, and then we need to change our button to row 10. All right, it's Monday morning, you gotta bear with me. Monday morning in Vegas. All right, that's better. ID, that's sort of, kind of weird. So let's go back and change it to what do we want? What, what do we have it before it was ID, let's go delete ID. So we're really explicit in what's going on here. Okay. Now we're good. So now we want to be able to, you know, if we show the records, that's showing up. We're probably going to want to change that to put it underneath it. So let's do that right now. All the fun with Kenter. So that would be the query and here the query label. So instead of row eight, we want row 11 now. So let's save this and run it and make sure this is working. All kinds of good stuff in this video. All right, so show records, boom, that pops down below there. You might want to play with the padding here. This is kind of close. This, there's more space in between these two than there is in between this. So just, you know, you might want to do that. I'll just leave that for now. Uh, you can play around with the padding in this stuff if you like. Probably just add a pad Y to, to these two. Well, let's just do that right now. Why not? We're doing all the things this morning. All right, so back down here to our delete. And here we'll just go, what, pad Y equals... Okay, add this five, delete box label. And where's the actual delete box? Right here. Pad Y equals, give that a five, save this, run it again. Okay, that's looking a little better. I like that. Okay, so now we need to fix our delete record uh, button to actually delete a record. So let's say, well, we'll, we'll do that later. I'll actually delete one later after we fix it. Let's clear the screen, it's starting to get a little crazy. All right, so when we click this delete button, it calls the delete command or the delete function, which is up here. We did it at the beginning of this video and we wanna get rid of this placeholder. And this is kind of a strange thing. We don't want to, what we're gonna do is come down here and get our, let's see delete box entry. And we're gonna get that like we've done before. But your instinct is gonna to be to go delete box dot get like that, but that doesn't work. What you have to actually do is concatenate that on afterwards. So if we save this, now come back here and run it. Pull this over. 
we can show our records, Bob Smith. Let's delete number two. Now if we show the records again, uh, there's some weird formatting here, but it goes from one to three. Now if we close this and run it again, and show our records, we see number two, Bob Smith is gone, and it was just that easy. So pretty simple, delete from your table where OID, which is the primary key that we've talked about before, equals, and then concatenate this on here. Now this is a string. Now this is weird because it's an integer in the database. So you would think it would need to be an integer, but you can't concatenate an integer on here. So for some reason with tkinter, you can pass a, an integer like this as a string and it will still delete it even though the database has it as an integer. So uh, that's how you delete from a table, not too bad. And in the next video, I think we'll learn how to update a record. So we have these things here. What if we misspelled Miller? How do we change that? I will look at how to do that in the next video. In this video, we're going to look at how to edit or update a record. And I thought we'd create a whole new window that pops up that has all of the updating, editing stuff in it, as opposed to trying to cram it more stuff onto this screen, which is starting to already get kind of full. We could do it all on this screen, have the, the record update right in these boxes, but that seems a little complicated. Plus, it allows us to create a new window, and that's kind of fun. We learned how to do that several videos ago, so if you need a refresher, go take a look at that in the playlist. So first things first, I'm going to change this delete ID to select ID. So from now on, if we want to delete a thing, we select it and then click the delete button. If we want to edit it, we select it and click the select button. So I'm just going to change that, that word right there from delete to select. So uh, let's find the delete button. Here it is right here. And let's go select, I guess. Okay. And, uh, if this is the first time you're watching, this is the code we've been working on on all the videos up until now. So uh, you're going to want to go back and look and see how we made all this stuff. So now let's create another button right below this one. And let's call it, let's go create a, an update button. I think update would be a good thing as opposed to edit. doesn't really matter. And let's change this uh, from delete button to edit button or update button, whatever you like. And it's going to be in row 11. Now, in our query field or our query function, it puts the output on row 11. So we need to probably change this to 12 to put it below this button. That will work. All right. So instead of select record, we want this to say update record or edit record. And edit is smaller than delete. So the button itself needs to be a little bigger, 145 ish probably will work. All right, let's save this and just give it a quick look to see if, if that worked. Uh, close it, run it again. Pull it on over. Um, it's pretty close, maybe a smidge smaller, maybe. And if we click show records, the stuff still shows up below. So that that's looking good. Uh, so yeah, let's change that from what was it 145 to 144. <laughs> eh, we're just picky at this point. Uh, still a little bit too big, maybe 143. I don't know. I'm just playing. I kind of like doing this stuff. All right, that looks better. So now, did we not change this delete ID to select ID? Uh, where is that? That is the delete right here. Select ID. Forgot to do that. All right, save this. Give it a quick look one more time. <laughs> okay, so now it says select the ID there. We could select. Oh, that's why. This should still say delete record, not select record. All kinds of weird stuff going on this morning. Uh, all right, so delete record, not select record. Okay, so save this, run it one more time. Hopefully we got it right this time. All right, so select ID, we could select whatever. And if we wanted to delete it, we click that button. If we want to edit it, we click this button. We haven't actually created an edit or update function. So let's go ahead and do that right now, or at least start to do that. All right. So you'll notice when we created this update button, I just copied this code. So the command is delete. We don't want that. Let's go uh, edit. Yeah, that sounds good. So now I'm going to come up to the top of our program. 
and any old where really let's go define edit and let's give this a comment let's say create uh, edit function to update a record okay so like I said earlier we want to create a whole new window for this so I'm just going to come up to the top of our program and I'm going to grab all of this stuff and we could just paste it right in here and make sure it's tabbed over. And instead of root, what do we want to call this? Let's call it editor. And so we need to change each of these root guys to editor. And the title, let's say um, update a record, I guess. I should really pick edit or update. I keep using both of those words. Uh, whatever. All right, so let's save this and run it to make sure that worked. After the day I've been having so far, who can tell if it'll work or not? Okay, so here we go. New window pops up, update a record. It says up here it's the same size as our old one, so that's good. Okay, cool. So now inside of that new window, we want the same boxes and labels to show up as that's in our main window so that we can you know edit those if we like. So I'm just going to come down to where we've listed those boxes here. I'm just going to copy all of this stuff. And let's come back up to our editor function. And I'm just going to paste it all in, highlight it all again like this and make sure it's all tabbed over. And since these are in different windows, we can probably keep the name the same but I'm always kind of leery of that just because it's kind of confusing. So I'm going to go underscore editor and just rename each of these things underscore editor. So I'm just going to, oh, let's use the mouse, click and paste and click and paste and click and paste every single thing. And we could do the same to the labels, but we're not going to be changing the labels or anything. So I'll just leave those the way they are. Uh, we don't need a delete box, so we can get rid of that and that. So that's looking good. Okay, now these we want them to show up in the editor window, right? So whenever we create a thing, we always specify right here where it goes. And these are all root by default. So we need to change each of these to editor. Editor, 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 editor. Same thing with the labels. Boom. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and save this and run it just to make sure everything's coming along correctly. So edit record. All right, that's looking okay. Now we want a button underneath that says save. So whenever we change these things, we can click the button to save those changes. All right, so let's do that right now. And we're going to come down here to all of our other buttons. I'm just going to copy one of those and bring it back up to our edit function. Now we don't necessarily have to do all of these things in the edit function, but I like to keep all my code sort of together. And we want to create a, a save button to save record, to save edited record. Okay. So we want to save record. And let's see, we're in row five. So now this needs to be six. And let's give that, let's give it a 145 and see how that looks. All right, so let's save this and run it just to make sure that worked. Edit record did not work. All right, what did we do? Ah put it in root. This needs to be in editor, of course. All right, so save that, run it again. Let's see if that worked. Edit record. All right, save record, it's a decent size. All right, coming right along. Now, next we need to sort of propagate or whatever you want to call it, these fields with whatever record we have selected, right? So when we click edit, this will pop up and it'll have record number three, Tina Miller, already filled in to each of these boxes, right? So how do we do that? Well, 
same thing we've done many, many things in the past. We want to come down to our, let's see, query function and just copy this stuff basically. Uh, yeah, copy all of this. So then come up here and right at the top of our function here, I'm gonna paste all this in. So we need to, of course, as always, connect to our database, create a cursor and execute it. Now we wanna select everything. We don't necessarily need the OID. We're already gonna know what that is from addresses. But now we need to designate the specific field. But before we do that, let's create a variable for that field. And let's call it record underscore ID and set that equal to what? Well, when we run this thing, the select box used to be the delete box. We come down here and get the name of that. It is, let's see, where's that? A delete button, no, delete box, right? Where it says select ID. We want that box itself, the delete box, which I guess is this guy. So let's copy this back up <laughs> to our editor. And we just wanna slap that into a variable. And so we get that, remember, we get, we get things from boxes all the time. And now we can take this and reference it. So we wanna select everything from addresses where OID equals, and then let's just concatenate that on there. That should work. Yeah. Okay, so now we want to sort of cycle through the result, the select result, and then put each of those things in one of those, in each of those boxes, right? So we've already kind of done this before. We used a for loop. So we went, let's see, we go for, well, let's make a comment. Let's go loop through results. So here we can go for record in records, right? And then remember, each item that comes out of here is a list item, right? So the zeroth item is the first name. The first item is the second name. The third, uh, second item is the address, city, state, zip code, right? So we can print out each of those things and we can do that just by uh, using an insert command for our boxes, right? So we have F underscore name underscore editor dot insert, right? And then we have to put a zero in front of it. We looked at insert when we learned how to do entry boxes, right? Those input boxes. And then we just put that thing, right? So we could just do this for each item in our database. So first name, last name, address, city, state, zip code. So here we just change this to L name and then address, city, state, zip code, right? And then we need to change each of these ones. So one, two, three, four, five. All right, so actually we don't need this code. I just, I just re rewrote it. But remember from our query, we're just pulling out each of these things, remember? Just like we've done right here, here, and here. Okay, so we can get rid of this. Now, there's one more thing we need to do. We've got these boxes created and they're below this for loop. So we kind of need to put this underneath. Oops, get the comment. So I'm gonna copy this and let's put that underneath these boxes. Okay. So that should work. So let's save this and go ahead and run it. See how we did. So we need to show our records and let's say we wanna edit Tina Miller. She is number three. We type her in there and click edit record. The new box pops up and her stuff is all listed in there. Now if we click this save record, we haven't actually built it to do anything yet. Now we just need to fix this button to actually record when we press it. So let's come down to our edit function here. And at the bottom of this, we have our actual button here and we've got it pointed to the edit 
function. That's no good. We need to create a new function to actually save this stuff. So let's call this update. And that should be okay. And now I'm just going to come up here above here. And let's just define update. And we don't need to pass anything in here. So like everything we've done, always, we need to do a database connection and a cursor. So I'm just going to paste that in here. And like always, we need to uh, let's see, close our connection, commit any changes we make. And we also want to delete the stuff that's in those, uh, those fields. So well, first, let's just do this. And there we go. All right, in our update guy. And like I said, we want to delete all those things. So let's look at the I think it's the query. No, the submit button at the bottom of this, we have all this code to clear the boxes on the original window screen. So let's just copy this and paste that in here. Because we definitely want to do that. Well, actually, let's do it after we've closed our connection. Now these boxes aren't named correctly. So let's go down to our edit field and our boxes are F name dash editor last name dash editor city dash editor address everything dash editor so we can just come up here and kind of paste all of this in oh you know what we don't really want to edit these or we don't want to actually do that anyway we just want to close the whole thing so we'll just close this whole window and we're done and that should be a lot easier so okay so now let's just worry about what code do we need to actually update our database record. And we've sort of, I don't know if we looked at this before, but we want to c.execute. And then the command, we want to use these triple quotes so that we can do this on multiple lines. Those are doc strings or doc types. I can never remember doc string, doc, ty doc type string, maybe. I don't know. You can look it up. Doesn't matter. Three three quotation marks to open and three quotation marks to close is what we're looking at. So what we want to do is we want to update and we want to update our table, which is addresses. S S E S addresses. Yeah, that's right. And then we want to set. And now we need to designate what we want to set. So remember when we first created our table, we named these columns, these things. So that's what we're going to use down here. So we're going to go first underscore name equals and then call this first. And you'll see what this colon first is in just a second. Uh, last underscore name equals last separating each of these with a comma uh, address equals address. Uh, what do we got city equals city state equals colon state. And finally, zip code equals zip code. All right? Okay, now we don't need a, qu uh, a comma for that last bit. I'm going to come down here and we need to continue on with our SQL statement. So when you update SQL, you update the table and then you set certain columns where certain things equal certain things. So we need to put a where clause in here where now OID, this is our primary key, where OID equals colon OID, and then the three ending quotes. So actually get rid of those. Okay, so what we're saying is, the record we've pulled up has a specific primary key. In our case, it's three, right? So we're saying update these things, these columns with this information for each one where our primary key, our OID equals some OID that we'll designate in a second here. In our case, it'll be three because we're updating record number three. But if you were update, updating record number 27, you would, you know, it would be 27, but it'll, it'll find that out on its own. So, all right, here, this is all the SQL command. That's that does the things, but now we need to sort of designate what these things are, right? We have to tell our code what is colon city, what is colon state, and we do that just right after the comma here, and we just create a uh, Python dictionary. 
bring this up. And inside of this dictionary, we just designate each of these things as the key value pair of the dictionary. This, these things are the key. So uh, we're gonna go com or, uh, quote first. Now you don't put the colon in front of it, you just use first. And then a colon afterward, because it's a dictionary. That's how you separate key value pairs in a dictionary. Now we need to just say, what is the data we wanna put in there? And this will be, if we go down to our edit, would be this, right? And we need to dot get that. Now, we also need to make a quick change to our edit function because these guys are being used inside this function. If we wanna use them in another function, we need to make these global. So let's go, create global variables for text box names. And then I'm just going to, for each of these, we just type in global and then the name, right? That's all we have to do. So let me just copy and paste this a few times. So last name, address, city, state, zip code. And then we can just pop each of these in address underscore editor, uh, city underscore editor, state underscore editor, and zip code underscore editor. Okay, so save that. That will work. Now we can use these each of these up here. So now all we have to do is just kind of go through here and for each of these go last. And again, that's this guy right here, colon, and then it's L underscore name editor dot get. As we've gotten things a lot, we get things all the time. Uh, let's see, the next one is address. And that's address underscore editor dot get. This is the boring part. City. Colon city underscore editor dot get and state colon state underscore editor dot get and zip code which is zip code underscore editor dot get and then one more we also have to have and that is oid colon and let's call this record underscore id right now this, we need to designate up here. So let's go record underscore ID equals delete underscore box dot get. And that is, if you think way back in the first bit of our code here, when we, let's see, Let's just run this real quick and see here. So it's this box right here. So when we show our records and we type a thing in here, this is the delete uh, delete box right here. And so we need to get three, which is the primary ID, right? So if we go back to our code here, that's gonna be all the way down here with our buttons. Create a delete button delete button, no, it's gonna be the box. So it's a delete box label, no, right here, delete box, right? So copy that, come back up here to our update function. And that's just this right here, delete box. Okay, so now, now the reason why we have to tack this on here is because where OID is OID, that's this thing right here. We need to define that. And that's where we do that right here. You'll notice these are just in order. So we have first, last, address, city, state, zip, and O, OID. So same thing here. First, last, address, city, state, zip, OID. I'm not sure that's necessary, absolutely, but um, that's what you sort of do. So, okay, so I think that looks good. We're 
This is our SQL statement. Update addresses, set each of these things where our primary key equals, equals the primary key. And then down here, you just sort of designate them. And this is just the way you do it when you have multiple things that you want to update. You know, in the past, I don't know if we looked at update in this specific set of series, a video, video series, but you don't have to do all of this stuff if you're just updating one column. But in this case, we're updating many columns. So we have to sort of make this Python dictionary. So, all right, let's save this and let's give this a run real quick. Let's clear the screen. And we have show records, Tina Miller, three. So let's go edit record. So let's go, it's not 21 Tina Avenue, it's 21 Tina Street, right? So now if we save this record, we can close this. Now if we want to edit records again, this thing pops up, and now it's 21 Tina Street. All right, so it actually did it now. This doesn't actually, once we click this, you know, this thing should disappear. So how do we do that? We can just give this, pull up our code. After we commit and close, we can just go, what did we call this other window? Uh, let's go down to the buttons. So much code going on, I'm losing track of things here. <laughs> All right, so edit. We run the edit command or edit function, which is this guy. And we're creating this editor window. Okay, so that's the name of it. So in our update function afterwards, we can just go editor dot destroy. Is that the command we want? Uh, let's see, I think it is. We need that, I think maybe. All right, let's save this and run it. All right, so three, edit record. Let's change this back to Avenue. Save it. That did not work. Editor is not defined. Well, let's make this global. Global editor. Will that do it? I'll try it again. All right, so select ID three, edit record, Avenue, let's change this to 22 Tina Avenue, save it, boom, it disappears. We can open it back up again. It's a 22 Tina Avenue, let's change this back to street, save the record, boom, it disappears. We can edit it again, it's back to street. All right, so that is looking better, looking pretty good. Uh, we don't need this entire, extra stuff, we could just change this to this if we want. So let's do that real quick. So when we edit, instead of 400 by 600, let's try 400 by 400. Let's run this again. Record three, edit record. Eh, that's a little bit better. Let's try, what, 300 maybe? Just playing at this point. Three, edit record. All right, that's a little better. Let's leave it like that for now. All right, guys, in this video, we're gonna build this very basic little weather uh, air quality monitoring app with Kinter and Python. And in the next few videos, we'll make this maybe a little bit more interesting. In this video, we're just gonna start out with the basics, connect to a third party API, grab some weather data, bring it back, do stuff to it, put it out on the screen. Think air quality, think like smog, pollen, stuff like that. I live in Vegas, I love to hike in the mountains around here. We're pretty high up above sea level, so a bad ozone day could really sort of affect you more at these higher altitudes. So I always wanna check the smog and the, uh, the air quality before I go hiking. And there's this cool website, let me see if I can pull it up here, airnow.gov, and you can punch in your zip code and get the current you know, air quality level in your area. So, you know, good is green, we have moderate, this unhealthy for sensitive groups, unhealthy for everyone, very unhealthy, and you know, run for your lives. So we're gonna build this app, 
And you can see right now it's green 38. If it was moderate, this would be yellow, right? If it was unhealthy, this would be red, etc. So we're gonna build out all this functionality in the next few videos. Now, there's an API that comes with this you can connect to to get this data. So that's really what we're gonna be learning here, how to connect to an API out on the internet with a Kinter project. So, you know, there are millions of APIs out there. And if you learn how to connect to them, from Kinter, you can use all of them. So, you know, if you're not interested in air quality, that's no big deal. You still wanna watch this video just to learn how to connect to APIs and stuff like that. So uh, check out airnow.gov. And I should mention, as we build this thing out in the next few videos, we'll make this a little bit more interesting. We'll make it bigger and we'll put maybe a, a search bar where you can look up specific zip codes and things like that. For, for Just for now in this video, we're just gonna connect to this thing and do the very, very basic stuff. So first thing you want to do is head over to docs.airnowapi.org. And this is their website where they have the API stuff. And just go over to the login page and let's see, request an AirNow API account. Click this link and fill out this form. It's completely free. You just have to fill it out with your email address. They'll email you uh, some, a little link that you can click to, you know, prove you are who you are or whatever. Let's go ahead and do that. Once you've done that, come back here and just log in. And there we go. And you'll see this page. So go to the web services and there's all kinds of stuff. We can see the forecasts or we can see the current data and you can do it by zip code. You can do it by long longitude and latitude if you happen to know your current latitude and longitude. Um, let's see, you can do it by, I think there's something, yeah, bounding box. I'm not really sure what that is. We just want zip code. So if you want to quick take a look at the documentation here, this is the stuff it's going to return. So if you want to read through here, it'll return the hour, you know, the local time, the area. So, you know, in ours, here it says Las Vegas. It returns us Las Vegas. So we know where the data is coming from. Uh, it also returns the state. You can put Nevada on there if you wanted to. I don't really care, so I didn't put that on there. It returns the latitude and longitude. That's interesting, right? If you need to look up latitude and longitude for some other project and you just don't want to mess with it, it's really hard, use this. It will. You can enter a zip code into this thing. It will return that latitude and longitude. That might be a good lookup tool for you in the future. Eh, keep, an eye, keep, a, keep that in mind. Uh, parameter name, the AQI. This is the actual number. Now this thing will return several numbers. It will return the AQI, which is this, which is an average of, I guess, these three. So it returns ozone level, particles, uh, PM10, and particles PM2.5. And PM10 and 2.5, those are just the size of the particles. So uh, these are particles under 10, I don't know, millimeters, whatever unit of measure they use. And this one's 2.5, I'm gonna say millimeters. You can click on here, there's a, a frequently asked questions uh, somewhere. Yeah, fact sheet maybe. Oh, right here, fact, frequently asked questions. It'll go into all that if you're interested. We don't really care. What else? Category number and category name. These are the good, moderate, unhealthy, you know, run for your live numbers that sort of correspond to these things down here. So that's cool. Okay, so. That's the documentation. Now to use this thing, we have to create a query. So they have a little query tool, it's very cool. You can just enter your zip code, put the radius you want, I'm gonna put five miles. And then here it lets you select what kind of data you wanna receive. Now we want a JSON, you almost always wanna use JSON when you're getting API data. So now you click build, Now this is your URL. You can grab this and use it. You can also run it just to see, this is the stuff it's gonna return if you're interested in that. So, okay, we're good to go now. So I'm gonna head back over. I've just created a new file called weather.py. This is the same sort of starter code that we've always used. I'm gonna change this really quickly though to um, 400 by 50, so it's smaller, right? And I just wanna, oops. I'm just gonna paste in our URL just for future reference. Okay, so now we wanna talk about how exactly do you connect to a third-party API out in the World Wide Web, the wild, wild web, uh, and then bring the data back into your, your program and your project. Well, there's lots of different ways you can do it. I always use something called requests. 
and it is well, let's just import it here import requests and notice it's plural we also need to decode the stuff that it brings back now it's bringing it back as json so we need to use in uh we need to import json now json uh, javascript object notation comes with python um, but requests does not so head over to your terminal and i'm just in our c gui directory where we've been doing all the stuff throughout this playlist and we just want to pip install requests now i've already done this so it says hey you've already got this but you probably don't it will download and install it for you and you're ready to go so that's really all we need in order to start using this request and i think you're gonna be surprised just how easy this is so uh what we want to do is let's just create a variable i'm going to call it api request because that's what we're going to do and this is going to be a requests dot get and then oops we want to spell request right requests right and that's just this guy right up here right we're going to get and then we just want to paste in our our whole query URL that we created just a minute ago. And you notice it has my API key. Now don't use my API key. I'm going to delete it as soon as I finish recording this video, so it won't work for you. Go ahead and sign up for your own. And where do we get that API key? Well, it put it in. It you see it's right here. But it it added it for us automatically because we're logged in here, so it knows who we are. It, it knows what our API key and it just puts it in there for us. So that's very cool. All right, pull this back up. Okay, so we're almost there. Now we want to create a new variable. Let's call it API. Uh, you call it anything you want and set it equal to json.loads. And we just want to pass in whatever content we got from this. So we go that dot content, right? And that's pretty much it, right? So actually, I'm going to change this back to 400 for now. Now, we need to do something else. We need to set up a little bit of error handling. So let's go try. We want to put this in a try block, right? So if it doesn't work, we want to throw an exception. So let's go accept, uh, call an exception as E. And oops, there we go. And inside of here, let's set API to just error for now right so basically what we're going to do is we're going to say hey go back go get this actually we should probably just put all of this in the there we go inside of here right so basically we're going to say hey try to go get this information from this url once you get it try and parse it you know strip it out of its json and, and make it into a python usable thing if there's a problem, if you can't connect to the website, if something goes wrong, throw an error where instead of our output being API, the output is error. So then when we put API onto the screen, it'll say error instead of the stuff, right? So, okay, now let's just create a label. Let's call it my label, call it whatever you want and set this, this is just a Kinter label. And so we want to put it in root. We want the text to equal API and that's pretty much it for now I think and now we just want to pack that onto the screen so let's just go my label dot pack okay so let's go ahead and save this and I think that will do for now so let's head over to our terminal and let's run this python weather dot by uh oh Invalid syntax. Oh, yes, it is. We need a colon, right? Obviously. All right, so save that. Let's try this again. All right, so in here we have our box, right? And let's make this big as we can. You can see there's all kinds of stuff in here, and it's just kind of spewed it up onto the screen, right? So, what is all that stuff? Well, it's just this exact stuff, right? It's returned, it looks like a Python list, right? And we know that because it has square brackets on the outside. So it's a list, but inside of the list is a Python dictionary. And we can tell that by the squiggly brackets. So I'm just gonna copy this real quick. And instead of looking at it 
in the, the GUI. I'm just gonna, oops. I'm gonna create a new file real quick and paste this in here. So, okay, notice the uh, square brackets on the outside. So that's a list. And then notice the squiggly brackets on the inside. But let's look through here. We've got, looks like, oh, here is one list item, right? So we have opening squiggly bracket and closing squiggly bracket. Here is the second list item. So let's go through here. Opening squiggly bracket, closing squiggly bracket. And here's the third list item. Now, this is what you're always gonna do with API data. You're gonna see how it gets returned and then you're gonna just figure it out because no two APIs return data in the same way. Some APIs return them as dictionaries. Some return them as lists. Some return them as lists with dictionaries in them, like we're seeing here. You just have to look through here and figure it out to figure out what it is. So we're seeing a list with three items in it, right? So how do we sort of grab the first item? Well, you remember Python lists start at zero. They're numbered, right? So zero, one, two. So there's three items, but they start at zero, one, two. So this is the second item right here. Oops. <laughs> right here, right? This is the first item, and this is the zeroth item. And if we look through these things, they're all the same, except for this, the first one is just returning the AQI, the, the average of all three of those things. Ozone, no, actually the first one here is just returning ozone. The second one is returning that PMI 10 maybe? No, PMI 2.5, you see right here. And the third one is returning PMI 10, if we can find it, yeah, right there. So. For me, I don't really care about the PMIs. That's sort of like pollen count, you know, little bits, little particles of pollen. I just want the ozone. If you wanted those, you can grab those. So we just want this first thing, which is the zeroth thing, right? So to get that, let's grab our code here. And what we want is instead of putting on our label API, just the whole API, we can call the specific item. So if we want the zeroth item, uh, we could save this. And let's run this guy again real quick. Did I? Didn't I fix that? <laughs> uh, I must have accidentally deleted it. Okay, so save that. Put the colon there for sure. All right, let's try this again. Now, it's kind of hard to tell, but we only have, we could see one thing. The date observed, hours observed, we don't care. Reporting area, Las Vegas. Uh, AQI 38 in the category number. Now notice the category number itself is another dictionary because it has two items in it. So we'll have to play with that a little bit. So okay, we're getting there. So what do we want? We actually just want, well, we want three things. We want this reporting area. We want the actual AQI and we're gonna want this category. So one thing at a time, let's grab the reporting area. How do we just make that appear? Well, Pretty simple. We just drill down even further and inside of parentheses, go reporting area. All right, so if we save this, let's run this guy. Boom, we have just Las Vegas, right? If we want just the AQI, instead of reporting area, we go AQI. Now, AQI is the actual number, right? The air quality indicator or index or whatever. And right now we can see it's 38. Very cool. Uh, what was the other one? Let's look at our code here. The other one was category. So if we go category, oops, come back. You. Remember this one was a little different, right? It returns a dictionary with the number and the name. We don't know, we don't care about the number, we want the name, we want it to say good air quality. If we returned one, what would that mean? No, we want the name. So how do we get the name? Well, <laughs> let's see, code back up. We once again, just keep stringing these guys along, right? and boom, we get good. So, all right, that's how you do that. But now this is all 
we don't want to keep doing this inside of our label because that's just kind of weird. So let's come up here and let's create some variables. So let's go uh, city equals and let's go a uh, let's go quality quality equals and let's go what what do we call this category equals and we'll put this one as category just paste in all of these actually so the city was uh what was that reporting area i think reporting area get rid of that and the quality was just aqi i believe um oh there's no space there reporting area let me check to make sure uh yeah reporting area in fact we could just copy and paste that okay aqi and category name okay so we've got our three variables here instead of doing it like this let's just sort of how do we want to do this let's go well the first one we want is city and then let's concatenate and let's type in air quality and let's concatenate again and we want the quality but this is a number the quality returns a number and this needs to be a string because we're we're putting these all in string so let's real quick wrap this in a string function we could have done that up here i guess but uh this is fine too so air quality and what else let's go let's put a space and then let's just finally put the category for now just to make sure we got it right category all right so let's save this run it see what errors i made because i always make errors as you know okay so las vegas air quality 38 good all right so we're getting there all right so let's play around with this a little bit more now i'm going to change this from uh, 400 to 50 and we can actually change the font size of our label just by coming up here and at the end of our label stuff we can just type in font now we can pass in, uh, let's go, I want this Helvetica, is that spelled right? I think so. And I want font size 20. So let's save this, run it, see how that looks. Okay, so Las Vegas air quality, 38, good. This might be a little bit smaller, so let's play around with this just a little bit. Because I like to play around with these things. So instead of 50, let's try 40. I don't know. <laughs> All right, that looks better, I think. Now, we have good as the air quality. And so we want this thing to change color based on that. And this video is getting a little bit long, so I'll just start to do that in this video. And we'll pick that up in the next video. But for now, just at the end of this, in our label, I'm just going to put another comma and we can just type in background and set that equal to green. Now we'll do some logic later on to decide what color to put in there based on what the actual AQI number is. But for now, I'm just going to put green just to sort of wrap this up for today and make it look nice. Okay, so that's starting to look good. But now the rest of it, oops, there we go. There's white around the edges and stuff. So the background of our thing needs to be changed as well. So uh, we could do that a bunch of different ways. Uh, probably the easiest for right now is just to come up here to our configuration of the actual project. And I can go root.configure and then just set the background uh, to, I don't know, green for now. We'll, we'll use hex color codes in the future. So save this and oops, come back here, run it one more time. All right, so now we have Las Vegas air quality, 38, good. And we can put hyphens in the middle of this if we wanted to, or like right here or something, but we're gonna change this later anyway. So we'll just leave it like this for now. So, okay, that's pretty much it for this video. Now let's look at this one more time very quickly because this was insanely easy, right? We're connecting to a third party API by doing nothing more than calling this requests, which we pip installed 
right? Telling it, hey, go out and get this URL, bring it back here and, you know, convert it from JSON into a Python list, which then we just broke apart and slapped it into a label, just that easy. And uh, that's one of the really nice things about Python. You know, if you use like Node, for instance, running out and getting stuff from an API with Node can be kind of a hassle because it's asynchronous and it, it gets crazy. This is just as easy as can be. And I think you'll probably see that from giving this a shot. All right, guys, in the last video, we uh, started to build out our air quality app here. We can look up the air quality in our area and flash it onto the screen. In this video, we want to expand on that and change the color based on that number. We've got this very basic app built right now, and uh, it looks up the air quality. Right now, we can see in Vegas, it's 36, and that's good. And so we're showing green. But what do we do if this is a different color? If we go back to the website here, you can see there's yellow, orange, red, looks like purple, and I don't know, maroon maybe. And uh, you know, if you're 50 to 100, you're moderate. If you're 101 to 150, you're orange. If you're 151 to 200, you're unhealthy. If you're 201 to 300, you're very unhealthy. And above that, you're, you know, run for your lives hazardous. So we want our little app to change colors based on what these are. So uh, pretty simple to do. We should be able to knock this out in just a couple of minutes. So let's just kind of uh, dive in and do this. So head back over to our code. And this is just the code from the last video. If you didn't see that video, look in the playlist for the one before this and check it out. So one thing I'm gonna do very quickly, we've got our label here. I'm gonna copy this and put it inside of our try loop because I started thinking about it and I'm like, well, you know, if it tries to find this data and it can't, yeah, it's gonna throw an error, but then it's gonna throw another error down here when it tries to put this, uh, these, let's see, these variables in there and they don't exist. So we should really put this in our try loop. So, okay, go ahead and do that. Next, we need a basic if statement, right? So if the color is, uh, you know, if the category is good, show green. If it's moderate, show yellow. If it's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So let's just go ahead and do that. So let's go if, now, what is the thing we're, we're looking at here? We're looking at this category variable. This is gonna return the category name, which is good, moderate, uh, unhealthy, very unhealthy, et cetera. So if category equals, and make sure you got the double equal to sign that we're comparing here, right? So if it equals good, and what we're searching for this good is, let's pull up our app here, is this right here, good, whatever this word is. And we get that just from the website, good, moderate, USG. The only difference is this USG doesn't return USG. It returns the whole string of unhealthy for sensitive groups. So we'll have to make that little change here. But otherwise, we're just going to copy and paste each of these uh, names, each of these category names into our little if uh, statement. So, all right. So if category equals good, we need our colon. Then let's create a variable. Let's call it weather color and set that equal to some color, right? So we don't know the colors yet. We'll get to that in just a minute. Um, but this is gonna be, you know, something like green. I'm not gonna use the word green. We're gonna use color hex codes, HTML codes uh, to make the colors, but we'll just leave it as green for now. Okay, so that's that. Now we need to do another if statement and another if statement for each of these category names. So instead of just creating a bunch of if statements, we're gonna do an elif. Python elif statement instead. So elif category equals, what's the next one? Let's look at the website here, moderate. So if it equals moderate, be sure to capitalize it. It's case sensitive here. Then let's just grab this and I'm just gonna leave these blank. All right, so let's just copy and paste. There are, we've got two so far. And if we look at the website, so one, two, so we got one, two, three, four more to go. So I'm just gonna copy and paste this in four times. And make sure your tabs are uh, lined up. I'll show you what I mean in just a second. Three, oops, there we go, four, I think that's right. Notice how all of these if and elifs line up with tabs. Now notice these are not spaces. Like if I hit my space key, it goes like that. That's not what we want, we want tabs. Everything needs to be tabbed. And the same thing down here, this is a tab as well. Notice it's not a space, 
it's an actual tab. Python is tab sensitive, it's very important. So, okay, so now, so let's fill these out. So instead of moderate, what's the next one? Uh, USG, so this is unhealthy for sensitive groups. So this is what we need to paste in right there. I'm just gonna copy that and paste that in. All right, the next one is unhealthy. Just type that one in, unhealthy. Okay, then the next one is very unhealthy. Notice the capitalizations, very unhealthy. And then finally, the last one is hazardous. So let's see how do you spell that. I'm just gonna copy this one. Hazardous is a hard word to spell. <laughs> All right, let's pull this up. Boom, hazardous, no space there. Okay, so now what colors do we want? Well, there's an easy way to pick the colors. You can just come back over here, and for instance, I'm just gonna pick this one because I'm not really sure exactly what color. Well, let's do hazardous. I don't know exactly what color this is. So if you hover your mouse here and then drag and click this, now right click, and at least in Firefox you can do this. I don't know about Chrome. You can view the selection source. And when you do, it shows you the color that it is right here, the background color. So we can just kind of copy this and right in there, paste that in. Okay, so I actually went through and, and copied and pasted all those little things in here. So I'm just gonna come through here and grab each of these. So this one's good. So good is green. This one is moderate. Moderate is, you can see there's two colors here, the background color and the color. We want the background color because the colors are all the same. That's white. Well, not quite the same. So, okay. This one is moderate. Oops, come back, come back. Where's our moderate? Right there. So unhealthy for sensitive groups. There we go. There we go. And the next one is this guy, which is unhealthy. Find our unhealthy, boom. And then very unhealthy, which is right here. Copy, paste, copy, paste. And finally hazardous, which is this color, apparently. I don't know what all these colors are. Oh, we already did hazardous. There we go. All right, so let's save this. Now, we're getting there. We've got our if statement done, but now we need to come through here and change our label. So remember when we did our label in the last video, we put the background color as green. Well, instead of that, we need to do this new weather color variable that we created in our if statement. So make sure not to do it inside the quotation marks. You just want to put it like this. So, okay, that's almost done. Now we also have this up here, root configuration, the background of the actual app itself, we need to change as well. So we'll put that in here, but now we need to move this because uh, Python starts at the beginning of the program at the top and it comes down. And when it gets to here, it's looking for this weather color variable. We haven't created it yet above here, right? It's down here. So we need to change this. Actually I need to just move this entire line and let's put it inside of our try loop. Because again, if it tries to get this data from the API and there's an error, it won't it won't throw up this or it'll throw an exception, right? So in which case this won't throw an error. So, okay, that's looking good. So let's go ahead and save this. Now, I don't know if this is gonna work or not. <laughs> I think that's all the moving parts, but let's give it a try. Let's run this again. Okay, so sure enough, and you can see that's, you probably can't tell, but that's a slightly different color green than just calling green. And that's great, but their quality in Vegas right now is good. So let's go hunting for uh, another town or city or something. Ooh, there's some orange. Let's check this out. Let's click on here. Where are we at? Cincinnati. Um, hmm. Uh, that doesn't help us any. Let's try up here. What's, what's this? Oh, it looks like Idaho of some sort. Looking through here. Salmon. Right? Uh, it's no good. 
Cordeline. Let's see, what is that? I'm gonna copy this, go to Google and type in zip code. Let's get the zip code for Cordeline, <laughs> or whatever that is. All right, so that is 83814. So let's put this in our lookup thing here. And right now this is hard coded into our URL here, which is not optimal. In the next video, we'll make a little search function, a little search bar that we can type in a zip code. But for now, we can just hard code that in. And let's come back over here and run this guy one more time and see if it changes to, oh, it still says 32. Hmm, that's no good. What's going on here? Well, hmm. Try that again. It says it's 60. Oh, that's the forecast, the current. Okay, so we need the current AQI. So let's go to Grangeville. I don't know what that is. All right, so let's go Grangeville zip code. 83. Five three zero. All right, so let's try this guy. And just copy and paste, save this, run it one more time. Still good. This thing lies. I think the the problem here is I've put in a five mile radius, and this is doing some other different radius, so it's not quite the same. All right, well let's keep looking. <laughs> we got nothing but time on our hands, right? Uh, let's see, Louisiana maybe. How's Louisiana looking? Oh, a bunch of, bunch of yellow. Baton Rouge. All the way across. Bunch of yellows. All right. So let's try Baton Rouge. Zip code. Bunch of zip codes. Let's pick one. <laughs> Fingers crossed this will be one that we like. And yes, <laughs> we have moderate. Which, if we look at our website here, moderate is yellow, our app is yellow, and all right, pretty good. So very, very easy. It's just a basic, you know, Python if statement, right? We didn't have to do anything complicated, but you know, kind of cool. If we look through here again, we could see, you know, just a basic if loop or if statement. And very cool. The only thing is we change this, we move this inside of our try block we moved our labels into our try block as well other than that nothing to it in this video we're going to add a search functionality so we can look up a specific zip code instead of having the zip code hard coded in what we want to do now is add just a basic form that we can enter in a zip code press a button and it will look up whatever zip code we entered in so pretty easy to do that and we've looked at how to use entry boxes, text boxes, uh, form boxes, whatever you want to call them in previous videos. So if you haven't seen that, go back and look through the playlist that's in the uh, comments below this video and you can look up that video. Um, so let's just come down here and below our, this is a code that we worked on in the last couple of videos, our weather.py file. And I'm just going to come down here and I'm just going to create a label. And we can really call this anything we want. I'm going to call it, I don't know, let's call it zip. And that's going to be an entry box and it's going to be in root, right? So that's really all we need right now. So let's go zip.pack to just pack this on the screen. And maybe a little bit later, we'll get a little bit more uh, interesting with the layout. But right now we're just going to pack everything up on the screen just to get the functionality built in. So we also need a button. So let's go um, submit button or zip button. And that's gonna be a button. And we're gonna put that in root. And the text, probably spelled root, right? And the text for the button, let's go look up zip code, I guess. And it needs a command. So let's send this to the zip lookup function. Now we don't have a zip lookup function just yet. We'll do that in a second. So let's go zip button.pack. And okay, so let's go ahead and save this. Now we need to create this zip lookup function. So let's do that up here at the top. And let's go create a zip code lookup function. So we want to define 
and we called it zip lookup. We don't need to really pass anything. So what do we want to do here for, for now? Let's just go zip. So let's just inside of here, let's just go zip dot get and uh, just to see if this looks right. So let's save this, come over to our terminal and let's run our app again. And you can see um, we need to do some resizing here. So, all right, let's close this and resize a little bit. So I'm just gonna come up here and let's just make this, I don't know, 600 by 100. So let's save this, come back, run our app again. All right, so we've got the current that's hard coded right in, and now we've got a, a form. If we type stuff stuff in, it doesn't actually do anything yet. Um, we could create a label underneath here just to make sure this is working. So let's do that real quick. So let's go inside of here. Let's call uh, zip label maybe equals. This is going to be a label. And it's gonna be in root, and the text is gonna equal, let's just go zip.get. Now let's go zip label and pack this onto the screen. Okay, so let's save this and run it just to see that this form is working correctly. So we can type in uh, 90210. Boom, it pops up. Now it doesn't change color. We haven't done that yet but we can cl keep clicking this and it just keeps popping up now that's because we've packed everything right so maybe we don't want to pack everything so instead of that let's really quickly just change everything over to a grid system so we could just go grid and then well let's start here our first the entry box let's go grid and we want this to be row equals uh, zero, oops, no quotation marks, zero, column equals zero. And I'm just gonna copy this. And then our button, let's put this on the same line. So row zero, column one. And inside of our thing here, we want this to be a grid. And we want this to be row one, column zero, and let's give this a column span of two. So it at least spans both of those. Well, yeah, let's, let's give that a try. Now, all of this stuff, we wanna put this inside this zip lookup, right? Because we don't wanna hard code this anymore. We just want this to, uh, to show up whenever we press the button to look up a certain zip code. So I'm just gonna kind of look through here and let's grab all of this, try and accept stuff, copy this and let's put it inside of here. So let's see, we need to work on our indentation. So indent everything over, so okay, so try and the accept are lined up the stuff inside the try is all lined up okay that's looking good so now down here we need to grid this too so we want this to be row equals um what are we on now one well actually we just want this right here right okay and we don't want this anymore or this or this we just did this in order to um, you know make sure the the form thing was working now this is what's gonna pop up this thing right here okay so now we need to change our API call right so find the zip code area here and put a quotation mark now we need to concatenate and we want this to be zip dot get whatever we put in the form, right? And we need to get rid of that hard-coded zip code and then quotation marks, so that looks good. Okay, so let's save this and run it. Let's see if I screwed this up at all. Very, very well might have. Okay, so now we have uh, just a very basic gray because there is no color because 
we haven't uh, added the zip code yet. So let's look up uh, 90210 Beverly Hills. North, Northwest Coastal LA air quality is currently good. And you notice everything changed to green, which is what we'd expect. Now let's go to 89129. North Las Vegas air quality. I don't know why it's saying north. Oh, that's the northwest from the, you can see it just put it on top of it, but it didn't clear what was already there. That's very interesting. We can mess with that later. Okay, but at least the functionality is working now. And that's what we want. So, okay, this whole thing doesn't look great. It's not lined up right. This looks kind of goofy, right? We can play with this a little bit right now. I'm not gonna get into it that much in this video. We'll work on that in the next video. But for now, just a quick thing we could probably do. Let's see. Let's go back and find our button in our entry. And let's just give this a sticky of what? Uh, let's go west plus east, plus north, plus south. And we want to do the same thing for the button. So if we save this, let's run this guy again, see what this looks like. And when we start out, it looks the same, but if we 90210 it, at least now there's not that gap between it and it sort of going the length of whatever has been returned, right? So if we change this to 89129, it still stays the same. Uh, let's run it again with an 89129 to start with. Okay, so it's this size. Now if we change this to 90210, everything kind of changes a little bit because this got bigger. And since the first one was smaller, the bigger one overlaps at all. So it looks like it's disappeared, but we'll need to work on that, uh, like I said, in the next video. Okay, so coming right along, uh, not too bad. And again, I realize this doesn't look great, but we'll work on making it look pretty, you know, in the next video or so. All we really want now is just the functionality to make sure this thing works uh, correctly. So uh, 60610, my old Chicago air quality. Everything's good this morning, apparently. So, okay. In this video, I wanna talk just a little bit about charts and graphs, right? Python for data analysis is super popular, data science, machine learning, all that stuff. And you always wanna create charts and graphs. And I'm not gonna get into Python for data analysis in this video. I mean, we're gonna use NumPy and we're gonna use matplotlib, but I'm not really gonna talk about them. For this video, I'm just gonna sort of assume you already know what those libraries are, how to use them, what we're doing with them. And in this video, I'm just gonna focus on taking data that we have, uh, manipulating it with those libraries, and then specifically throwing it up on the screen with a graph or a chart or something that we can visualize and see. And I wanna show you how to do that in Kinter, right? So it's very, very easy and it shouldn't take very long at all. So first things first, we need to install NumPy and matplotlib. Uh, NumPy is what we're gonna to use to mess with the data. Matplotlib is what we're gonna to use to throw up the graph on the screen. So we need to install these into our terminal. So let's head back over to our terminal and I'm just in my C slash GUI directory, the same directory we've been in throughout this whole video series. And I'm just gonna really quickly pip install NumPy. And it downloads and takes just a second here. And then we want to pip install matplotlib. That's doing its thing. Okay, so that's done, we clear the screen. Now let's head back over to our code here. And I've created this file called plots.py. It's just the same starter code we've been using. I changed the size to 400 by 200. And if we save this, there's nothing really to see, but we can run this, we can go Python uh, plots.py. It will pop up, it's just a blank window, 400 by 200 or whatever I designated that as. Uh, yeah, 400 by 200. So. First, we need to import NumPy and matplotlib into our program here. So really simple, we just import NumPy, and let's just call this as NP. This allows us to access NumPy by referencing NP, uh, instantiating it that way. And we also want import matplotlib.pyplot, we're gonna use some plots, as PLT. 
So that's all we have to do to kind of install these things and start using them. So let's come down here and let's just create a little function. Let's go define uh, graph or graph and let's do this. And inside of here, we want to create some fake data really quickly that we can use to make a graph out of. We could import something from like a CVS CSV file or something. If you have data, you can import that. I don't have any handy, so I'm just going to make some up. And let's call this um, house prices, right? And we're going to set this equal. We're just going to make some random data. So we're going to go np. We're going to call numpy dot random dot. We want a normal distribution. And again, if you don't know what this is, comment below. I'll make some videos on numpy, numpy arrays, and stuff like that. But here we want to say. All right, let's create some fake data about house prices in our area. Let's say the average price of a house is, I don't know, 200,000. And the standard deviation is, I don't know, 25,000. And then we wanna create a bunch of data plots of this data. Let's say we want, I don't know, 5,000 data plots, data, uh, data points uh, of this. And we want a normal distribution. We wanna generate this randomly, so that should work. Now, in order to, actually graph this let's say we want to do a histogram just you know bar charts that go up and down that show a, a distribution we can just call plt which is matplotlib you know we we called it as plt so we can reference plt and we want a histogram so dot hist right and what we want is house prices right so let's take this data that we just created and we let's just plot it right and we can we can specify how many bars, how many bins we want. So let's say we want 50 bins, doesn't really matter. And uh, that's pretty much it. So we've created this thing, now we need to show it, right? So let's just go plt.show, right? So if we save this and run it, of course, nothing's gonna happen, right? If we run it, pull this over, nothing has happened because we created a function, but we didn't actually call the function, right? So we need to create a little button, throw it up on the screen. So if we hit the button, the thing pops up, right? So we can go what um, my underscore button equals, let's call this a button and it's gonna be in root, which is just our root thing here, right? And let's say the text should be uh, graph it. <laughs> I don't know. And then we wanna call the command equals uh, graph, Oops. probably should spell graph right. Still did not spell right, G-R-A-P-H, okay, there we go. So that's just calling this function, right? And we, we don't have to pass anything in here, we're just calling the function and it's gonna generate this thing. So now we just need to my underscore button dot pack this guy onto the screen and that should do. So let's save this and let's head back over here and run this. Uh oh, my button. Oh, I misspelled button. I cannot type this morning. My button. My button. All right. Save this. Try it again. Second time's the charm. Boom. So we've got our thing. If we click graph it, it runs. And this whole window pops up, and we have this uh, histogram, which is. Very cool. And you can see it's sort of interactive. As I move my mouse around, the X and Y axis is down here at the bottom of the corner there, down here, change to tell me exactly where I'm at. So you can see our data, we created uh, houses that were average of $200,000. So you can see right here, that's right in the middle. So that makes sense. And the standard deviation was 25,000. So it goes up 25, it goes down 25, down another 25, down another 25, up another 25, et cetera. And it's normally distributed because our code called for a normal distribution, right? Pull this back up and very cool. And we can kind of zoom in here, right? We can do this and that's not that interesting. We can click home to go back. Uh, let's see, we can pan the axes, <laughs> move it around and go back. We can click this button and we get these sliders that come up and let us kind of play with this if we wanna, I don't know why you would wanna do this, but it's kind of cool, right? And uh, just that easy, right? Click reset, it goes away. Uh, we can save this, right? If we click this, boom, a whole save 
dialog box pops up and it works for us. It does everything. We don't have to write any save code or anything, right? It will create a, a PNG of this. Very, very cool. And uh, yeah, so, you know, we can change this if we want uh, no bins at all. If we run this again, oops, we gotta close this first. Boom. Run it again. You can see now it's blockier because there's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, well, nine, ten, I guess, uh, bins. We can likewise, you know, really define it. We could say 200 bins, right? Save this and run it again. Pull this over and graph it. Now we get all kinds of like much finer detail. And you can see it looks a little different even though we're changing the bin size, the shape of it is slightly different each time because every time we run this, we're generating a new random number. So it's gonna be slightly different, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, just that easy. So it really is just that easy to use graphs with Kinter. Now uh, there's all kinds of ones you could try. We could try Pi. Let's get rid of this. I'm, just, I'm not sure this is gonna work. <laughs> I didn't test this beforehand, but it might work. Let's try this again, graph it. Okay, so we're asking it to create some data, so it's taken a little while. And uh, you can see here's a pie chart. There's so many points though that it's it's kind of hard to make anything out. Let's close this. So we can head over to Google real quick and just type in mat plot lib charts, maybe. And here's some sample plots. We can click on here, different ones you can do. Uh, here's the one we did histogram dot hist, right? Uh, let's see what else is there. That's fun. Bar charts and you can click on each one. So let's click on pie chart real quick and it will tell you exactly the dot pie inside the parentheses, uh, what stuff to kind of, you want to put in your pie chart and you can customize it and stuff like that. Uh, for instance, if we go back and look at the histogram, where did that go? We'll see X, that's the data, that was our house prices, bins equal. Uh, we, we didn't put bins equal, we just put the number because you know you can do it like that too. Uh, the density and all these different things you can change on here. Very cool, let's see if we can't find one other one that will work quickly without a whole lot of customization. I don't know if there is one. Polar, let's see what this one is. Args and quargs, so maybe let's try polar. <laughs> I don't know what that is or what it will do, but let's try it anyway. So save this, come back over here, run it again. All right, so <laughs> this thing, I don't know what this is, but it looks cool, right? So it's just that easy, right, to do this. So like I said, I'm not gonna get into the data science of this, the Python, for a uh, data analysis or anything. I'm just gonna assume you kinda already know NumPy, NumPy a little bit. You already know matplotlib. And you could do the same thing with Seaborn and other libraries for graphical stuff. And uh, that's cool. So that's all for this video. If you liked it, be sure to smash the like button below, subscribe to the channel, and check out codemy.com where you can use coupon code YouTube to get $22 off membership. You pay just $27 to access all my courses, hundreds of videos, and the PDFs of all my best-selling coding books. Join over 60,000 students learning to code just like you. My name is John Elder from Codemy.com. We'll see you in the next video.